In our search for answers in the universe and in trying to understand how the universe works, the scientists have been proposing and verifying a lot of different incredibly complex ideas and theories. With a theory known as Standard Model of Particle Physics representing the most successful scientific theory that has ever been created. The theory whose main purpose is to explain what the universe is made from, how various particles interact in order to create what we observe in the universe, and what forces are responsible for helping all of these particles interact. With the main focus in this case being the basic building blocks of the universe itself, the subatomic particles that you see right here. And there is a really important reason for why a lot of scientists believe in this idea and think this is an actual theory potentially explaining the entire universe. Pretty much all of the abstract ideas, particles and forces proposed in this theory have been so far proven by using a variety of relatively expensive experiments including these so-called particle colliders. The really large structures whose main purpose is to try to accelerate particles to extremely fast velocities, producing the collisions which can then produce subatomic particles, allowing the scientists to confirm or disprove certain theories. And so far, all of the particle accelerators have been doing a tremendous job. For example, you probably remember the hype in 2012 when the scientists officially confirmed a really old idea known as Higgs boson. The official confirmation of a certain subatomic particle which contributes to the total mass of a lot of other subatomic particles. The idea that might not really have a lot of practical applications, but showed us that we do understand the universe a little bit better and that old theories were indeed correct. Higgs boson in this case is responsible for giving certain subatomic particles their mass. But despite its successes, the standard model also had its opponents. Certain scientists did not think that standard model explains everything really well and more importantly, they obviously tried to come up with alternative explanations. And although it does explain some things, it obviously does not explain everything. For example, this here does not explain gravity at all. There doesn't seem to be any particle present in this model that would explain how gravity works or would explain what particle is responsible for all of the effects we're observing. And it's not just gravity that it cannot explain. It also cannot explain some other unusual observations from across the universe. For example, neither dark energy nor dark matter are explained by this idea either. Even though we believe that the majority of the universe is indeed made out of dark energy and dark matter. So despite its accuracies, it did have certain problems. As a matter of fact, it obviously was not perfect. But now something else happened. Something that is actually putting this whole theory at a major risk of potentially being proven wrong. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to be talking about this very recent confirmation with a paper that took something like a decade to create and has almost 400 authors that suggests that something is definitely not correct in the standard model. It's not necessarily wrong, but it's definitely not entirely correct. So let's discuss this paper and the discovery in a little bit more detail and talk about the main reasons why this is creating such a problem. But let's start with what it's all about. It's about subatomic particles known as W bosons. But in case you have no idea what I'm talking about, let's just dissect this in a couple of minutes. So you probably know that you're made out of atoms. And the atoms in this case are made out of electrons that zip around a central area that has protons and neutrons on the inside. But if we zoom in, we'll find that protons and neutrons are actually made out of something else. They're made out of subatomic particles known as quarks. And as you can see right here, quarks come in six different flavors. Flavor is just another way of saying types. There's up down, charm strange and top bottom. With proton in this case being made out of two up and one down quark and neutron being made out of one up and two down quarks. Although the actual image is way way more complicated and there is quite a lot of interaction between these quarks with all of them constantly changing from one to another. And that's actually the important part. Quarks generally transform from one type to another and they do so through another interesting force that we usually refer to as the weak force, also known as weak interaction. And the weak force is one of the four fundamental forces that we know today. Two of the forces are pretty familiar to us because we experience them in daily lives. That's the electromagnetic force and the gravity. 
And the two other forces are, for the most part, only experienced by subatomic particles. That's the strong force and the weak force. And this image right here sort of shows us how the weak force works. Its only purpose is to transform one quark to another. Or basically, it's like this really strange alchemical force that transforms one type of matter into another type of matter. Literally, transmutation. Something that's mediated by two types of bosons, the W boson and the Z boson, which can then turn a neutron into a proton by changing one of the quarks on the inside. And that is a really, really important process in the universe. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for the weak force, a lot of things that we take for granted would not exist. For example, that's the main reason we have radioactivity or why nuclear reactors work to begin with. The process of atoms sort of changing into other atoms and releasing radioactivity and energy, along with complex processes happening inside our sun right now that create all of the energy that's producing life on our planet, all of this is regulated by the weak force. And all of this is guided and led by these W bosons, the subatomic particles that only exist for a tiny, tiny fraction of a second, roughly around 3 times 10 to the power of minus 25 seconds, as a matter of fact, and then disappear dissociating into other subatomic particles. They dissociate into either electron or a muon and a neutrino. But because W bosons exist for such a short period of time, it's always been extremely difficult to find out more about them and to not just measure their properties, but to even prove their existence. But their existence was proven a few decades ago. And after running thousands, millions, and then trillions of different experiments, using a variety of powerful particle accelerators, over time the scientists started to work out their properties as well. Specifically, their mass. Their mass was really, really important. Mostly because by knowing their mass, the scientists can then start figuring out what else they're discovering and potentially look for various anomalies. And so after trillions and trillions of experiments, mostly conducted right here in the Tevatron, the collider detector at Fermilab in the US, which is by the way no longer functional and has been replaced by CERN in Switzerland, the scientists seem to have identified something extremely unusual. Or actually, that's not entirely correct. The scientists were able to dramatically decrease the overall error of previous detections and previous calculations, discovering something really, really strange and something unexpected in the process. And it's right here in this particular graph. CTF2 stands for the Collider Detector at Fermilab 2 the new collaboration that took approximately 11 years of data analysis to dramatically decrease the overall error when it comes to the mass calculations of W boson. And here's how to interpret this graph. The gray line you see in the middle, that's the prediction of the standard model. The tiny red circle with extremely small error bars on the bottom, that's the new calculations. And as you can see, it's not really lining up. The new calculations suggest that the mass of W boson is approximately 0.1% higher than originally predicted. And although 0.1% doesn't sound like a lot, for particle physics where everything depends on a lot of accuracy and many theories connect to each other and depend on the extreme accuracy to explain what we're seeing in the universe, this sort of makes it a big deal. A huge deal. Such a huge deal, as a matter of fact, that certain scientists have already started speculating that it could maybe invalidate the standard model of physics. But that's of course something that I think a lot of scientists agree is a little bit too premature. Mostly because, well, if I go back to the previous graph, you'll notice that this is not the first time that it happened. A lot of previous predictions and previous analysis have also been sort of disagreeing with the standard model. Which doesn't suggest that the model is wrong. It just means that there is something in the model that we're not really understanding correctly and something in there is a lot more complex than we originally thought. And that's actually something that many scientists believed for a very long time. And for obvious reasons as well. As I mentioned before, once again, the model does not explain dark matter, it doesn't explain dark energy, it does not explain gravity. Something is definitely missing there. And on top of this, the weak force is already known to be really, really strange. For example, the weak interactions generally break a lot of different assumptions. One example we've talked about before, known as the parity symmetry, has been discussed in one of the previous videos right there or in the description that explains this in a little bit more detail. 
And so these discoveries point at even more oddities in the weak force and of course in the W boson, with all of this pointing at something missing in the standard model, or maybe some anomalies we need to explore. While at the same time some scientists have also suggested that, well, if you look at this graph once again, because of the precisions involved, the uncertainty here is quite large. As a matter of fact, the calculations, the analysis, and the combination of all of the uncertainties from other studies over time can actually start adding up and producing tiny errors. And so at least one explanation here could be that, well, maybe it's just a combination of different errors altogether. In other words, because of the ridiculously complex calculations involved here and tiny tiny minute particles that only exist for a fraction of a second, it might actually just be impossible for the scientists to truly produce a super accurate result. But that's of course just one of the potential explanations that doesn't break the theory. Although in reality, at the moment there is really no explanation for any of this. There does seem to be some kind of a unusual discrepancy, and the discrepancy in this case seems to violate the prediction that we used to have about W bosons. The mass of this particular subatomic particle in reality seems to be approximately 0.1% higher, enough of a difference to create problems for a lot of different theories. But unfortunately at the moment that's pretty much where we are. The discovery is very very recent and it took approximately 11 years to get here. But where we go from here, or how this changes the standard model in the future, at the moment nobody knows. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about these incredible discoveries in regards to fundamental physics. And more specifically, we're actually going to be combining two different discoveries, which in a sense suggests that our understanding of fundamental physics is still not really perfect because both discoveries suggest that something else is going on in the universe that we don't really understand. And what I'm actually going to be discussing is the very recent announcement from the Fermilab of the so-called G-2 experiment that has been confirmed officially to have something unusual going on in it, and also this completely other discovery from CERN in Switzerland, which also suggested something else going on with a completely different particle in a completely different experiment. Both discoveries were made only approximately a week apart, and both to some extent are kind of groundbreaking, at least for the particle physicists. For us, for normal people, we still don't really know what all of this means. But as always, let's start with the baby steps. So today, in modern physics, the so-called standard model of particle physics is probably the best model we have for the world around us. Basically, the 17 different subatomic particles you see right here more or less represent what we believe happens in the world around us, at least when it comes to particle interaction. With the idea known as QCD or quantum chromodynamics being responsible for explaining how all of these subatomic particles interact with one another. And over the years, over the past few decades really, a lot of different experiments conducted in various particle accelerators for the most part have been consistently proving this idea over and over. All of the theoretical predictions such as for example the famous Higgs boson were eventually confirmed by various experiments in for example CERN inside the Large Hadron Collider located in Switzerland. Now all of these experiments over the years once again allow the scientists to quite confidently say that our understanding of the world and specifically the standard model of physics for the most part seem to have been correct. But the model was obviously still not perfect. For example it still didn't really explain very well how gravity works or how objects are able to attract each other. It also didn't really explain the mysteries of the universe such as dark matter. But more importantly there were some experiments that created the results that were kind of difficult to explain. And one such famous example from 1990s was what's known as the Brookhaven experiment. Although according to Google, it's also some sort of a VR shooter game which I don't think I'll ever be playing because it kind of looks scary. Anyway, that one experiment created a tiny problem for the particle physicists which for the past few decades they've been kind of trying to figure out. But what exactly is this problem and why is it a problem? Well, it really has something to do with the predictions of one of these subatomic particles. And specifically this particle right here known as muon. As you can see it's pretty much the cousin of electron except that it's dramatically more massive, like 200 times more massive. But in every other respect it is very similar to electron. 
As a matter of fact, other properties like spin and electric charge are exactly the same as an electron, so the only main difference here being the mass. And one of the main reasons we're not really as familiar with muons compared to electrons is actually because we haven't really found a practical use for them yet. Electrons are obviously used everywhere, that's how electricity works. But for muons, one of the only uses we have for them so far are, for example, various types of penetrating scanners, such as ground penetrating scanners, which muons can do much better than electrons, because they're basically more massive and can easily go through matter and thus detect objects much deeper in the ground. As a matter of fact, right now, as I'm speaking to you and as you're listening to me, or more specifically in the area around one square meter around you, about 10,000 muons go through that area every single minute. And the way that they form is through the interaction of cosmic rays coming from very powerful quasars, supernova, and a lot of other powerful objects out there with the upper atmosphere of planet Earth. And as these elements strike the upper atmosphere, the muons that are generated as a result go through pretty much everything, including you and including the ground underneath. And some of them can actually even go through the entire planet entirely. So muons are generally really good at penetrating things. And so over the years, the scientists have learned quite a lot about them. And one of the properties that is known to scientists about muons is that if you were to place them in the magnetic field, they would basically start spinning. And this spin itself is known as the g-factor, with the g-factor for muon being g-2. So next time you hear someone say muon g-2, that's basically what they're referring to. They're referring to this predicted value of a muon spinning inside the magnetic field. But it turns out that this value is actually not really true, with the main reason being virtual particles predicted by the quantum physics. As these virtual particles start to appear everywhere, they actually interact with the spin of muons and end up increasing the value by just a little bit. So it's not really two, it's more like 2.002331 and so on. And this value that you see right here was the predicted value from the most recent very, very thorough analysis from 2020 that was released by a lot of scientists working together. Now, this is a mathematical prediction value, and it just so happens that that experiment I mentioned previously, the Brookhaven experiment, found this value to be a little bit different. Something wasn't really adding up. And so for the past few decades, the scientists in different labs were trying to recreate these results with the Fermilab, whose video I'm using here, essentially even getting a completely new super powerful magnet just to study this effect, just to find out if there is something going on after all. And well, as you can probably imagine, after years and years of studies, they finally have the results. And the results, well, let me show you the picture to summarize this. The results sort of confirm the original Brookhaven result and definitely go against the predicted model that was just confirmed last year. And even though the actual difference is really, really minuscule, the experimental results here don't really align with the standard model predictions. The difference is quite significant, which means that both experiments found some sort of an anomaly suggesting either A, the 17 subatomic particles we have here do not necessarily explain the whole world around us. There might be some other 18th hidden particle that was just discovered. Or B, something completely different, something that nobody really understands yet, is happening to the spin of these muons, which might be some sort of a fundamental discovery in regards to muons that nobody has ever made before. Either way, for the particle physicists, this is one of the biggest groundbreaking discoveries of the last 50 years. But to make sure that this is a real discovery and not some sort of fluke, because there is still a tiny, tiny chance that maybe this was a mistake, and specifically here we're talking about 1 in 3 million chance, the scientists are going to be conducting this experiment 5 times in total. And if after 5 times they still get the same results, well, in that case, there's definitely something going on. And so, in that sense, it's a discovery that doesn't have an explanation or even theory behind it. Nobody really knows what's happening here. But that's just one of the discoveries. Remember in the beginning I mentioned there were two discoveries? Well, the second one is completely unrelated, although maybe somewhat related. And by the way, check out the video from Fermilab if you would like to learn a little bit more detail about this discovery as well. But anyway, so Fermilab discovered one thing, but CERN in Switzerland discovered something entirely different and also unexplained. And in this case, it's kind of related to the main premise of the Large Hadron Collider, or basically its main purpose. Its main purpose is to study hadrons. It's to study the particles that are made out of elementary particles. So in this case, 
If we take one of the quarks, specifically an up quark, and if we combine it with a down quark and another down quark, we're going to get a neutron. If we combine two up and one down quark, we're going to get a proton. Those are hadrons. Hadrons are basically the larger particles that are made from subatomic particles. But we don't have to combine three of them. What if we combine one up and one down? We still are going to get a hadron, but it's not going to be stable and it's actually going to fall apart, creating something entirely different. And so that's pretty much what CERN scientists have been doing for years and years and years now, and that's kind of the main purpose of the experiments there. They try to create hadrons, they try to destroy them, they try to collide them, and then try to see what happens. But a lot of this is also based on various theories, and many of these theories have been confirmed over and over and over again. And one of these theories is about this one hadron known as Beauty Meson. Okay, more terms. So this one is basically created from combining one down quark and one bottom anti-quark. So here we actually start using a little bit of antimatter. Although even here you can combine some other quarks to create slightly different beauty mesons. And just generally, to create a meson we need some sort of a quark and an anti-quark. But it cannot be the same anti-quark because then it just eliminates and creates energy. Anyway, long story short, the predicted model for these beauty mesons suggests that they do fall apart, creating an equal amount of electrons and once again muons. And more specifically, they should be producing an equal amount of electrons and positrons, or muons and anti-muons. And so here, if we were to take about 100 of these beauty mesons with time, after only a few milliseconds, all of them should create approximately 50 electrons and approximately 50 muons. But as this paper that was recently released by certain scientists discovered, they don't. The data from this experiment suggests that a lot more electrons are produced compared to muons. And this once again suggests some sort of a problem with the theory and very likely suggests some sort of an unusual, not well understood and possibly completely unknown to us physics at work. Something that many scientists will be studying for years to come. Now, it could be related to the previous muon discovery, maybe muons are the actual culprits behind both of these discoveries, or maybe there is some sort of an unknown subatomic particle in existence that absolutely no one understands just yet, but at the same time, the real answer is that nobody knows. And this is of course the beauty of these modern experiments. Today we've reached a point where the experiments are so advanced and are so precise that it's very difficult to argue with some of these discoveries afterwards. And if the scientists have detected something, and especially if they've done it several times, it might indeed suggest new physics at work. And because we haven't really changed the fundamental physics for about 50 years now, in some sense for particle physicists, this is a groundbreaking discovery. But for us, for the normies, for people that don't really do particle physics, well, we don't really know what to think of this just yet. I mean, like I mentioned before, we don't even use muons in real life just yet. We don't really know what they're used for or what they can be useful for. But if muons one day do become as important as electrons, maybe then we might appreciate these discoveries a little bit more. For now though, it is more or less theory only. We still don't really know where all of this will lead and if it's actually going to help us explain the universe around us. Nevertheless, super exciting discoveries, very unusual how both discoveries happen around the same time, but hopefully in the next few years we'll know exactly what's happening here. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this thing right here, the mysterious slash controversial EM drive. Originally proposed pretty much exactly 20 years ago by a British engineer, Roger Shore. And since then, quite a lot of different studies, including this one right here from NASA itself, try to see if the device actually works and if there's any merit behind the proposition. But as you can probably tell from the title, three recent studies have actually finally put this to rest. EM drive doesn't work. But let's take baby steps and try to summarize the last 20 years in, well, basically one video. So first of all, Roger Shore actually created a company known as SPR Limited that also patented this technology pretty much 20 years ago. You can read more about the original propositions and also learn a little bit more about SPR Limited, the company that Roger Shore created to patent this device, by following the link in the description. But just to summarize all of this, here is sort of what all of this would look like. EM drive, also known as Q-drive or RF resonant cavity, or the impossible drive, sort of works like this. At least according to the author. You would have a magnetron producing a lot of different microwave radiation that enters this cavity, 
that sort of looks like this. It's smaller on one side, bigger on the other side. And the microwaves on the inside start to generate what's known as the standing wave, resembling something like this. Now, according to the author, according to Roger Shore, this will produce more force on one side, larger force on the other side, and in essence will then produce a push in one direction. So this type of a device is also known as microwave resonant cavity thruster, with the explanation itself being essentially that you get differential radiation pressure on two different ends. But there's a problem with that explanation. It sort of violates the fundamental physics of conservation of momentum. In other words, in simple terms, it's sort of like sitting inside your car and trying to make your car move by pushing not onto the back of the car, but literally from inside the car and pushing onto the windshield. Naturally, this would probably not work. Another really interesting analogy here is with a typical sailboat. Imagine putting a fan on the back of the sailboat and then blowing that fan onto the sail. Would that make your sailboat move? Now, I think most of us would probably say no. However, interestingly, there is a video from Mythbusters from about a decade ago that tried to simulate this using this model you see right here. And interestingly enough, they were able to create a little bit of a push by turning the fan left and right, and essentially by blowing into different sides of the sail. Now, it's not entirely clear if they could produce the same effects in a more enclosed environment. Chances are that it's not going to work. But in this particular case, it worked and it was a very interesting experiment. I'm going to link one of the videos in the description below. And so, is something similar happening in this case? Is there some sort of an unusual effect that we can't really think of right now that seems to be generating a little bit of force by having two sides that are different in size? And if so, how exactly does it work and what's really producing the thrust? Well, first of all, several experiments have already been conducted um, a few years ago, with the bigger one being from NASA and another one being uh, from a Chinese university, and both of them initially claimed to have some positive results. And because the NASA's experiment was conducted in an um, almost complete vacuum, meaning that no air pressure and no airflow would be responsible for any of this, a few years ago, because of this experiment, a lot of people started talking about AM drive once again. But a lot of physicists and a lot of scientists were not convinced, because there was still this violation of momentum. And more importantly, because neither the original engineer nor the NASA scientists here had any explanation for what's happening here. One of the potential explanations was essentially from the quantum physics field. The British scientist who I previously mentioned in my quantized inertia video try to explain this by using the so-called Casimir effect. Now, this is actually a well-known effect uh, where we know that there is a slight pressure, or to be more specific, a sort of similar idea known as the Unruh radiation. And we know that Casimir effect does actually exist, and we know that it does work, but it produces really, really small amounts of pressure. So, for example, if I were to place really, really thin plates right here next to each other with extremely small space between them, on the inside between the plates, the amount of different particles, or specifically virtual particles created, is going to be less than the amount of virtual particles on the outside. Or basically, there's going to be a lot more radiation pressure coming from the outside than there's going to be coming from the inside. This is actually the result of the quantum physics, where we know that different virtual particles are created even in complete vacuum. And if there's less particles on the inside compared to the outside, there's going to be slight pressure. Now, this Casimir effect is extremely minuscule, though. And it still doesn't necessarily explain what exactly is happening with this particular drive and how any of this produces pressure in this case. Actually, Mike McCullough tried to explain it, but so far the experimental evidence does not support his proposition. And apart from the NASA's attempt, as I mentioned, China has also tried to create something and was partially successful according to the scientists behind the study, with China's Academy of Space and Technology even claiming that they were going to test this in space um, to see if it actually works, and possibly even placing it on all of the satellites in the future. But the thing is, this was like five years ago, and since then, no new developments. As a matter of fact, complete silence. But at the same time, only a few months ago, Roger Shore himself once again tried to present his new ideas and talk about how his device seems to be working, and even claimed that we can one day create these beautiful spacecraft that can travel extremely fast, or possibly even create an engine that can actually function without any fuel by literally replacing the engines we currently use and taking us to orbit around planet Earth without any fuel. All of this sounds like a really grand proposition, but according to his calculations, it might work. Well, okay, time to get a little bit more skeptical. So first of all, 
Shower's explanation so far still does not explain the reasons why it works or actually explains anything that would make any sense in terms of the preservation of momentum. He tries to explain it in several videos, but unfortunately he's missing some crucial points there. More importantly, even in NASA's science paper, despite the measurements of slight force, very tiny force, of several micronewtons per kilowatt, which by the way represents an extremely tiny force, but force nonetheless, one of their own explanations does actually involve temperature change. In other words, they kind of suggested that maybe what they're seeing is not really happening inside of this cavity, but it's actually happening because the device warmed up and because things got deformed slightly, producing slight force simply because the measurement devices were slightly deformed. And because the only other reasonable explanation here is either completely new physics or physics that are broken in some way, a lot of scientific community and a lot of explanations did actually involve potential errors or measurement problems when it came to the actual setup. Which is exactly what the scientists behind three recent papers decided to do. They tried to recreate a relatively similar setup to what NASA had and to what the Chinese scientists did, and then decided to use a slightly different suspension points on the same type of an engine. And their somewhat simple yet somewhat brilliant setup allowed them to once and for all prove that AM drive indeed does not work. Because by using this exact same setup, first they were able to recreate exactly the same thrust observations as the team from NASA, but then they were also able to completely remove it by changing to a slightly different suspension system. So in other words, when a different mounting configuration was used here, there was absolutely nothing visible in terms of any more thrust. Whereas thrust was produced when the device was mounted in the same way that the NASA did it. Which of course means that the best explanation so far is really the temperature. Because there is so much power flowing into this device and because so much heat is generated inside, this seems to also affect the device or the scales used to measure the force. It warps the scale just a little bit, putting it into a completely new zero point, which when measured then appears like there is some kind of a pressure going on on the inside. And so by rearranging the device and by choosing a different mounting point, all of these effects suddenly disappear completely. But naturally, the original creator, Roger Shore, is not really happy with this explanation and have already suggested that either the design was wrong or that they basically misunderstand how this device works. Although, to be honest, I don't think anybody knows how this device works, if it works at all. But realistically speaking though, it's been 20 years and we still haven't created anything that seems to work and all of the recent experiments show that it was basically a measurement error which is often the case when unusual and physics-breaking announcements are made. Which would also explain why China hasn't mentioned anything in the last five years. They probably realized it was a huge measurement error, and because the discovery was probably kind of embarrassing, they decided to just kind of uh, brush it away. Now, so does this mean that the EM drive and the so-called impossible drive is impossible? Yeah, it looks like it is. It, it looks like there is nothing in there that seems to work and it does seem like it was basically just a major mistake in terms of calculations. However, it still doesn't mean we should stop trying to discover these drives. I mean, technologies like this can potentially exist. I mean, for all we know, maybe there is a way for us to somehow use the Casimir effect or the Unruh radiation to propel these devices. But at the moment, every single experiment that was scientifically rigorous pretty much confirmed that this doesn't really work and if such a device could work, we still haven't discovered it. In other words, physics has not been broken, it was most likely just a calculation mistake and things like that happen all the time. And so on that note, I guess 20 years later we can finally forget about the EM drive. It was a cool little thing, cool little proposition, but unfortunately it's not really physics, it's more like science fiction. In order to study the universe and in order to understand how things work in the universe, we obviously also have to study the actual particles everything is made out of. The Lego blocks of the universe, if you will. And to do this, the scientists usually use particle accelerators and try to collide various smaller particles in order to create these huge showers of subatomic particles, which then can be studied mathematically in order to determine what's actually happening here. So kind of like taking a bunch of Legos, smacking them together, just to see what pieces fly out and to see what's all of this made out of. And that's of course how the scientists eventually realized that all of the protons and all of the neutrons are made out of even smaller stuff. Things we refer to as quarks. 
with pretty much all of the science textbooks today showing protons as this. Two up quarks, one down quark, a bunch of squiggly lines, known as gluons between them, surrounded by a shell that represents an electron. And ironically, very recently, we've talked about one of the major discoveries in regards to this structure that actually helps us understand what's going on inside protons and neutrons a little bit better. With the most recent visualization of all of this showing us that the proton probably looks like this. These unusual white formations, these clouds, these are gluons. That's where most of the mass of the proton is. If you were to somehow see through this, and if you were to remove these gluons, you would then start seeing some of the quarks. With the quarks essentially appearing this way. This particular simulation from the Jefferson lab is right now the best simulation slash visualization that the scientists currently have for what they believe happens inside protons, neutrons and other subatomic particles. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about this very recent discovery that suggests that this actually might be kind of incorrect or at least missing something on the inside. There might be a major part that's not showing here. A part that was only recently discovered by using analysis using very complex machine learning. And all this is based on a study that was only released yesterday, from when I'm making this video, that kind of shows us that there is very strong evidence for the existence of what's known as the charm quark inside a typical proton. And if correct, that's a huge discovery. A tremendous discovery. It's a discovery that will require rewriting a lot of textbooks out there. But as always, baby steps. So as I mentioned in that previous video that you should probably check out if you'd like to learn more about protons, neutrons and quarks, this by itself is already incomplete. These squiggly lines here that represent gluons that connect quarks in reality are the major part of the proton. So these quarks that you see interacting with one another, they only represent like 1% of everything, all of the energy inside a typical proton. 99% are gluons. With these two types of quarks, up quarks and down quarks, forming the rest. And if we were to take a look at all of the known subatomic particles that basically make up the matter as we know it, it would sort of look like this. And here as you can see there are six major quarks. The stuff that's familiar to us is mostly made out of up and down quarks surrounded by the electrons. But also naturally gluons playing a really big role in all of this as well. And in the last few years various experiments such as from the iconic CERN, the largest particle accelerator we have right now, the scientists were able to accidentally create some additional particles, sometimes even containing four quarks, with many of them being made out of strange quarks, charm quarks, or essentially quarks that are not in the same generation as the quarks that make up most of the matter. Now like many times in science, the names here are unfortunate. Naming them up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom doesn't really explain anything about them and actually confuses a lot of people trying to study them. So instead modern scientists usually just use the first letter. So for example, C, S, T, B, U and D. And so once again, U and D quarks are the most important ones because pretty much everything that we're familiar with and all of the stable matter around us, all of this is made out of U and D quarks, electrons and gluons. Whereas for example, S and C quarks can only really exist for a tiny fraction of a second. And even if they do create some kind of a subatomic particle by combining together, it will never exist longer than one second at least in the conditions in the modern universe. Today the scientists believe that maybe in the first few moments of the universe some of these components could have been actually uh, possible and might have even created some really exotic matter, but in modern universe, in these conditions, creating some kind of exotic particle that's stable out of these unusual subatomic particles would actually be kind of impossible. And so all of this is really more of a scientific curiosity. And so these strange and charm quarks or S and C quarks were never really used in anything other than theoretical physics. But I guess that's maybe until now. And it's based on something that the scientists originally proposed a few decades ago. So initially, back in the 60s, the first particle accelerator experiments finally revealed that there are smaller particles inside protons. And pretty much most of the papers proposed protons and neutrons to be made out of these three quarks. This was eventually proven through thousands and thousands of experiments in various particle accelerators on the planet. But these were never 100% accurate and there was always a little bit of a discrepancy here and there. That's of course just based on the nature of these experiments because here we're talking about super tiny particles and collisions that are always slightly different. As a matter of fact, this image from CERN even sort of shows us that sometimes even other quarks could be detected in various collisions even though theoretically we don't really expect to find them. Nevertheless, the modern image of a proton 
has always been shown as this. We have three major quarks and potentially some other subatomic particles produced here and there, but only temporarily. With once again the majority of stuff being gluons. And all this is of course because in these tiny tiny particles it's really the quantum mechanics that governs everything. Here particles appear and disappear all the time and the structure itself is entirely governed by the probability and by quantum mechanics. And so the production of other matter and antimatter particles can actually happen inside the proton. But at least one paper from the 80s has already suggested that there might be a permanent member that's present along with the up and down quarks. Or in other words that the proton might contain not three but even five different quarks with charm and anti-charm being the additional members. Back then this was highly debated but no conclusive evidence has ever been found. And really mostly because of these very powerful collisions with all of this energy producing all kinds of quarks in the process. And so sometimes it's kind of difficult to separate minute details. But the recent analysis did something a little bit different. They actually combined the results from thousands of different experiments in the process identifying that there was a slight discrepancy of about 0.5% that added a little bit of momentum to the proton with this extra momentum coming from something else. And this is of course not the first time something unusual was discovered in these particle accelerators that could not be explained right away. There's actually another video that was released a few months ago that you can find in the description that talks about some of these discoveries. But this time is different because the scientists might have discovered what's happening. And as I mentioned before, they used machine learning for this. They essentially used the model to try to come up with various hypothetical scenarios that could explain some of these observations. In this case, the use of machine learning was particularly interesting because it might have avoided certain biases that physicists tend to have. Or it might have even helped them come up with solutions that nobody would be able to come up with. And they then compared some of their models to the results from over 500,000 different collisions from various particle accelerators that ran experiments in the last few decades. In the process of discovering that just having three quarks would match these results with only 0.3% accuracy. But by introducing charm and anti-charm quark, which exists somewhere in the proton on more prominent basis, all of this suddenly made so much more sense. Although at the moment this has only been proven with what's known as three sigma level. Basically it's an interesting discovery, but it's definitely not a concrete proof and not an official discovery just yet. Nevertheless, a really intriguing proposition. And of course, if correct, it would suggest that a typical proton is actually what's known as a pentaquark. Something we've discussed a few years ago and something that was always believed to be a kind of an exotic particle. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's a lot more common than we actually think. And maybe the structure of the proton that we already thought was pretty complicated has more quarks on the inside and thus way more complexity. But unfortunately, at the moment, this is all only based on statistical analysis. It's not an actual detection and it hasn't really been officially verified by anyone else. But a super exciting first proposition nevertheless. And so whether the scientists in this case are correct or not, only time will tell. But does this actually change anything we know about protons in terms of, for example, practical use or in terms of what we detect from around the universe? Well, at the moment, the only possible detection we might have that could have slight differences in what we're seeing is from the idea we refer to as the cosmic showers. When very powerful cosmic rays from outside of the galaxy, very often from various blazers and very powerful black holes, strike the upper atmosphere and by colliding with various protons and neutrons, end up producing a kind of a shower of subatomic particles. Now because they do actually collide with protons, if those protons contain charm quarks, what we observe on the planet could be a little bit different and might end up in the production of certain subatomic particles we don't expect. Something that could be confirmed with one of many neutrino detectors located on the planet. Although in reality, it's really hard to tell right now what any of this leads to and what potential discoveries the scientists will be making if this is actually correct. Still, a pretty exciting discovery, something that might require future science books to be rewritten and I guess more importantly, an additional level of complexity to the already ridiculously complex proton and neutron that has so much stuff going on inside of it, even though most school textbooks usually kind of will leave it at that. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and right above me is one of the most powerful particle accelerators in the universe. Essentially an extremely fast spinning black hole with extremely powerful magnetic fields that generates these very powerful astrophysical jets that then release all of these particles nearly at the speed of light very often over 99.9% .9 of the speed of light. 
but naturally particle accelerators also exist here on planet Earth, some of them much larger and much more powerful than others. For example, this is the one in the US in the Fermi National Lab, but there are obviously even larger ones available in Europe. But they do come in different shapes and sizes, and they actually serve very different purposes. This one here is mostly used for research. Smaller ones, or the ones that are usually not circular, are often also used for various scientific purposes or even for medical purposes. Here's an example of a hospital accelerator that produces extremely powerful X-rays, usually by accelerating electrons, for either scanning purposes or, more often, in various types of treatments, often involving some kind of a destruction of tissue that requires a lot of precision. As a matter of fact, nearly 30,000 different particle accelerators exist on planet Earth and are used for a tremendous amount of various reasons, with many often used for some kind of a scanning purpose, not necessarily for research purposes. And that's because particle accelerators are extremely good at accelerating, for example, electrons, which can then start producing extremely powerful radiation, specifically very powerful X-rays, produced when electrons usually find themselves in extremely powerful magnetic fields or experience very high acceleration. We usually refer to this as synchrotron radiation. And so this is actually one of the main ways scientists usually produce extremely powerful hard X-rays, which makes the particle accelerator technology extremely useful for many different reasons. But it does have a bit of a problem, and you can probably see this problem behind me. To make these powerful emissions, or to produce these very powerful X-rays, we do require these very large constructions. And most of the particle accelerators today will usually accelerate the particles in a very similar way. They will usually accelerate electrons using very powerful electric fields inside a long tunnel with various metal tubes connected to one another. But the strength of the electric field inside these tubes is usually at its maximum. Making it even a little bit higher will usually result in a powerful lightning storm inside these tubes, which can actually damage them or even destroy them completely. And so since we can't make the electric field stronger on the inside, the only other solution in order to accelerate things faster is to make these tubes longer. And the longer the tube, the higher acceleration you can produce at the end, with obviously the circular formations, in theory allowing us to accelerate things even higher and allowing us to reach even higher velocities. But making these kilometer or several kilometer long structures is obviously first of all not cheap, also not really efficient, and involves a lot of financial and logistical issues. But these X-rays, these hard X-rays, are becoming even more important in a lot of different fields. So for example today they're used by various large companies in the field of electronics research, various types of medical and drug research, or any other kind of research involving molecular structure where you actually have to be able to produce the image of what it is you're building. You can actually learn about some of this research in one of the links in the description. This is from the Stanford University and their extremely powerful LCLS, Line Coherent Light Source. The tool has been used for a lot of different types of research and it's actually quite in demand despite its extremely high costs. But that's of course using this old way, using the metal tubes and electric fields. What if we try to do this a different way? by using something entirely different and by building something extremely small. By using plasma, lasers, and a very interesting phenomenon that we kind of observe here on Earth when dealing with, for example, water. Okay, so imagine a boat going on the water. You'll notice that it produces a wake behind it. But deep inside the wake, there's also a structure where in theory you can actually surf, acquiring some of the velocity from the moving boat. This is often referred to as wake surfing, but this particular phenomenon can also be applied to other types of waves. For example, waves or different disturbances created inside plasma when something extremely powerful travels through it. This phenomenon is sometimes referred to as wake field acceleration, but a very specific type of this acceleration known as laser wake field acceleration, originally discovered back in 1979, was demonstrated at small scale in 1995. Although that original discovery in 1995 was at extremely small scales, and this is actually where the limitation was. The scientists weren't really sure how to employ this to larger scales in order to create even larger acceleration. And that's of course until now. In the recent study, the scientists were able to accelerate electrons using this technique, achieving nearly a speed of light, by using something that was only about 20 centimeters in length. Using a phenomenon produced by very powerful lasers as they travel through thick plasma. But the previous type of an accelerator would have to be at least a few hundred meters in size in order to achieve the same results. But how does all of this work? Well, it turns out it's not really that difficult to understand. 
If you were to take a cloud of plasma, which is basically ionized hydrogen that has both positive and negative charged particles on the inside, but also generally acts kind of like a fluid, it then becomes possible to manipulate this plasma by sending various electrical fields through it. But it also becomes possible to create various types of waves here by creating different types of charge separation, or essentially separating the negative and positive charges, which in essence starts producing something equivalent to waves inside the plasma itself. And so understanding that you can actually create waves inside plasma, the scientists can then try to manipulate it to create that wake field effect. And they can do so very effectively by using a very specifically shaped laser, or by using an appropriately shaped pulse of laser that can disturb the waves in just the right way, they can then force these electrons to start surfing the wake, very similar to how this surfer is doing it on the water. And because of this, this is sometimes also known as the surfatrons instead of accelerators. And so by using two laser pulses sent through this hydrogen gas, the scientists were able to trap the electrons, allowing them to accelerate nearly to the speed of light, with the first laser pulse punching a kind of a hole through the plasma, and the second more powerful pulse scooping up the electrons and sending them along the wake, accelerating them to very high velocities, with the current energy for the electrons being approximately 5 giga electron volts, or approximately 40% of what you would achieve in a much larger kilometer size particle accelerator such as the one you see right here. But obviously using much less energy, using way less space, but more importantly using a groundbreaking technology and phenomenon that up until recently was really only more or less theoretical and has only been demonstrated at very small scales. But this time they were able to create something much larger that allowed them to punch a hole through the plasma, keeping the energy focused and preventing the beam from falling apart. And so it was really through the precise control of hydrogen plasma that the scientists were able to create these very high velocities. But because this has worked so efficiently this time, it's quite possible that this might be the beginning of a completely new era for particle acceleration, with this particular technique potentially being applied to a lot of other stuff as well. Technically, we can produce waves and wakes in a lot of different conditions in a lot of different materials. And so by applying something like this, but in a different environment, we might be able to achieve high velocities in quite a lot of other areas, potentially even going beyond electron research. But as always, this is just the beginning. We don't really know where all of this goes, we just know that this is groundbreaking and this will definitely change the technology we currently use. Which actually remind me of something from my childhood and probably from a lot of your childhoods. We've all used to have particle accelerators in our homes and they actually brought a lot of happiness to us. A typical TV set using cathode ray tubes, the old school TVs as they're known, were technically miniature particle accelerators. For example, the CRT monitor I used for years and years when I started using the internet was basically accelerating particles toward me and producing quite a lot of entertainment and education. And so naturally, these particle accelerators have always been part of our lives. But obviously, these were not producing X-rays and were producing much lower frequencies. And so even though we might assume that particle accelerators is just the domain of science, in reality, they used to be pretty much everywhere in every home. But that's beside the point. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and what you're seeing right here is the world's first video of what's known as a time crystal. Now it's a complex topic, but we're going to dissect exactly what it means, and this video will hopefully help you understand the significance of this discovery and this particular study that's found in the description below. First of all, what exactly is a time crystal? Well, it's a crystal in time, but okay, that definitely doesn't explain anything. Let's start with crystals. You might already know what crystals are, but just in case you didn't, it's essentially different types of materials that form very specific geometric shapes based on the underlying structure. Such as this crystal right here, known as galena, or the more famous example right here, known as quartz. And the formation of these geometric structures is essentially related to the underlying atomic structure of the material in question as it solidifies and forms this solid structure. And so, for example, let's just say we wanted to take a look at the molecules of the galena crystals. The structure here would look something like this. And as the structure grows and becomes larger and larger, the octahedral geometry starts forming these relatively large cube-like formations and sometimes octahedrons, formed because all of the molecules on the inside have exactly the same structure as well. Quartz, on the other hand, has a different molecular structure and thus results in a more hexagonal shape. 
And that's essentially how all of these crystals grow in a nutshell. As something solidifies and as the molecular structure stays constant, they grow into these large shapes, turning into large geometric objects, like this really cool halite crystal that's around 16 centimeters in diameter. And on the inside it kind of looks like this. And if you want to check out more of these images and also find out more about the crystals, you can find the link in the description. And so a lot of things out there become crystals. Things like water becomes ice crystal. We also have sand that becomes a crystal. Even your DNA and even sugar and salt become crystals. And we of course also have something known as liquid crystals that are often used in LCDs. So today crystals are used in a lot of different ways and we kind of depend on them both technologically and in terms of just regular life. Although interestingly, by definition, to create a crystal, the symmetry has to end at some point. So without ending the symmetry, you don't really have the crystal. But anyway, semantics aside, let's get to the topic at hand. Roughly around 9 years ago, back in uh, 2012, the very famous physicist, who you might have already heard about from a previous video, Frank Wilczek, who also won a Nobel Prize in Physics, made a theoretical proposition that, hypothetically speaking, we should also be able to have what's known as a time crystal. So a material that's not just symmetric in space, but is also symmetric in time, both in space and in time. It's a space-time crystal. And his proposition made a lot of sense, but nobody really knew how to approach it. Although within just a few years, in 2016, the first time crystal was discovered, although it involved some really crazy particles and a lot of spinning ions, and it wasn't really what you would call a um, symmetrical material in space. It was a time crystal though. But this time around, the actual creation was a lot different and way, way more impressive. As a matter of fact, let's actually just watch this video one more time. Because what you're looking at here is literally the first ever video of an actual space-time crystal. It's a material that's both symmetric in space and in time. And you can kind of see it coming back in time to exactly the same structure after a certain period. And that's something that we've actually never seen before. And something that was never created anywhere in the world. Which means that it took about 9 years to go from a physical hypothesis to literally creating this in a lab. And that's quite impressive. And to create this, the scientists had to use an extremely tiny micrometer sized perma alloy, which is basically a mixture of nickel and iron, and then blast this with a tremendous amount of microwave radiation. And this resulted in the creation of what they refer to as magnons. Magnons are basically kind of like pseudo particles or quasi particles that often arise when something interacts with something else. A more real life example here would be. Like something like this. It's a flock of birds that forms a shape. But this is a quasi-shape or a quasi-particle in this case. It's formed by individual birds, but the actual shape itself doesn't really exist. And this is an example of what magnon would be in physics. And what we're actually observing here is a kind of a recurring periodic magnetic structure inside the crystal that then remagnetizes once in a while. And that's because iron nickel material is quite magnetic, but they were changing the amount of magnetism by blasting this with microwave radiation. And so in this case, what we're looking at is essentially a recurring structure. It's a structure that sort of moves around a lot and then comes back to the original position after a specific time, thus creating the space-time crystal. But just like with a lot of similar ideas, kind of like Einstein back in the 1920s, Wilczek also predicted this to be very hypothetical and probably not really real. He didn't think it existed in nature or could be created. Einstein, likewise, also did not believe black holes were real. But now we know that both seem to exist and both are possible. And that's actually the mind-blowing part. It's the idea that someone had in their mind that was later created in a lab. And what makes this even more groundbreaking is the fact that this is at room temperature. These are not exotic components, these are not elements that are like near absolute zero. This is just regular metal stuff at regular room temperature. Which is actually really exciting because one day we'll definitely find a way to use this somewhere in the lab in some way or another. And one of the implications from the study already is that we could potentially use this in quantum computing. Because time crystals obviously allow us to predict what's going to happen in a specific period of time, we can use them to predict quantum effects. And a lot of quantum interaction by using qubits, for example, is actually easily achieved through the use of these magnons. Obviously, this is not a concept I'm going to be able to explain in this video, but you can also maybe check out some of the previous quantum computing videos I made that do actually go into this in some more detail. There should be some videos popping up above me. 
And because by nature these quasi-particles can interact with other particles and vice versa, it means that we can actually create systems using time crystals where things are controlled and where things are predicted very easily in both space and in time. Obviously, we already know how to use normal crystals, the space crystals. For example, your phone right now might be based on LCD, liquid crystal technology. But this right here creates a completely new field of study and also a potentially a completely new field of various products we might have in, I guess, three or four decades from now. Something that nobody right now can even imagine. And because this pattern was clearly appearing and disappearing on its own, without any changes in the microwave radiation, it only suggested that all of this was most likely quantum in nature. It probably related to the quantum spin or some other quantum element present inside of the molecules of this material. Now, how exactly this works is not entirely clear yet, but the scientists think that because of the microwave radiation bombarding this piece of metal, some sort of an oscillating magnetic field was produced inside the material, which then interacted with the quantum effects from the electrons inside iron and nickel, and thus produced this very unusual quasi-particle wave that was crystallized in both time and in space. And so here I guess it's important to kind of note that it's not really physical time crystal. It's not really made out of real molecules. Here it's made out of a quasi-particle and in this case of something related to quantum effects inside the atoms. And the other thing to note here is of course the camera that had to be used for this experiment. Apparently it's an extremely complex x-ray camera that was made specifically for the experiment. As you can see here, it actually allows us to see every single wave front, even though these are extremely tiny in size, only nanometers in size, and it shows us absolutely everything with relatively high resolution, about 20 times better than any light microscope can produce. And all of this was also filmed at around 40 billion frame rates per second, roughly around a billion times more than the video you're watching right now. So it's definitely a really cool discovery and a super cool experiment. But what exactly we're going to be using these crystals for, only time will tell. Unlike a typical crystal like this quartz crystal here, we still don't really have any physical use for them, but the potential for radio communication and for maybe even radar, or some sort of imaging technology, is definitely already there. We can also possibly use these time crystals as a way to keep track of memory in quantum computers, essentially quantum memory. And on the other hand, they can also be used to have particles interact across very, very large distances. So definitely a lot of potential applications. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about a pretty unusual and a pretty interesting discovery of a potential third type of subatomic particles. Although in this case, it's not a true subatomic particle, it's what the scientists refer to as a quasi-particle. It's a particle that sort of becomes only visible and only apparent in the presence of other, more simple subatomic particles. Now, this concept is actually pretty complicated, but it's been theorized for many decades now, and it's known as anion. And it looks like finally, after years and years of speculation, the scientists have been physically proved that they can exist, and they do form a kind of a third realm of particles that now have to be investigated in a lot of detail. And although by itself this whole concept is actually extremely complicated, I'm going to try to explain it in relatively simple terms and also give you a practical reason for why this is actually important. The reason being quantum internet and quantum computing, something that a lot of different countries and a lot of different universities are currently actively trying to develop. So first of all, let's start with something a little bit more simple with the basics. What you're looking at right here is a representation of a proton that same proton that's responsible for creating various atoms in the universe. And what's interesting about this particular image is that it actually shows you the two major types of particles, subatomic particles, present in the universe. Here we have both the fermions and the bosons. Now, in a nutshell, fermions, and in this example it's the quarks that are U, U and D, up and down quarks, with the other commonly known fermions being electron and neutrino, can be summarized as the subatomic particles that need to have their own space. They're basically kind of like the introverts of the subatomic particle world. For each of the electrons, for example, you have to have them in separate locations, in separate parts of space. They cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Which is actually why a lot of matter in the universe such as, for example, the exotic matter, like the one we can find in the middle of a neutron star, 
starts behaving so strangely. And that's because either neutrons or in some cases electrons start to get bunched up so close together that they actually start to produce a lot of really exotic interactions. They're essentially subatomic particles that do need to have their own space in the universe. Then we have bosons, which are these other types of subatomic particles that are, in a sense, extroverts. They can totally occupy the same space and share exactly the same point of space with other bosons. And in this image, the bosons are represented by these squiggly lines in between the quarks. This is what we refer to as gluons. The gluons, in this case, are responsible for essentially kind of connecting these quarks together. But from all of the bosons, you really just have to think about photons, the, you know, the stuff that produces light. We can technically shine exactly the same light at exactly the same spot, and it's totally capable of existing in the same spot at the same time without causing any exotic interactions or without causing any serious problems to anything in the universe. Something that fermions, like electrons, cannot do. So this is basically the main difference between the fermions and the bosons. And in general, fermions and bosons pretty much explain all of the interaction we see in the universe, with some minor exceptions. And for the most part, all of the visible matter in the universe falls under these two categories, and a lot of the interaction of the matter can be explained using either the fermion or the boson. And for many years, scientists have actually thought that maybe this is basically it, at least for our universe, for our three-dimensional world. But several physicists, specifically several theoretical physicists, did not really agree with this because they also realized that if you were to reduce one of the dimensions, in other words, if you were to turn three dimensions into two dimensions, you suddenly have a lot of these other unusual subatomic particles coming into existence and acting in very different ways. And one of the main proponents of this, and also the first person to actually kind of even explain all of this, is this scientist right here, who wrote this paper, you can find it in the description, Dr. Frank Wiljak, who essentially even kind of coined the term anion to explain that, you know, anything can go on in these conditions and anything can happen. It was really more of a play on words. But over the years, more and more scientists started to realize that maybe he was actually onto something. And specifically, they started to realize that by having only two dimensions, things like, for example, fermions, like electrons, would actually start acting a little bit differently and would start producing these unusual effects, at least in theory. This wasn't really practically proven and it was actually very difficult to prove as well. But the theory behind this was so solid that more and more papers started to come out in regards to this, started to explain how all of this could work, and most importantly, started to produce devices that can actually prove all of this and use these effects from these anions to possibly use them in some kind of a practical tool. And one of these practical experiments has actually been conducted by Microsoft, whose team is now convinced that this is maybe the future of quantum computing. And there's a really good reason for this. And that reason has to do with, in some sense, the definition of what anions are. So, in a sense, let's try to imagine what all of this means by using some of the images from this paper you can find in the description. In a normal three-dimensional environment, I can essentially take two particles and have one of them orbit or move around the other without really having it collide with that particle. So, for example, right here, these two random particles, in this case it's just golf balls, can more or less coexist with one another because of the third dimension. Even if I start trying to decrease the distance between them, they can always find a way to not really collide with one another and not to be in the same spot. And if we, for example, think of electrons, this means that these electrons can basically coexist in the same 3D location without really being in the same spot, which they're not allowed to do because they're fermions. But turns out things change completely once you remove one of the dimensions and force these electrons to do all of this in two dimensions. Which is pretty much what the scientists in this recent experiment were able to do by using this relatively complex device. When there's only two dimensions involved, at some point the two electrons are actually kind of forced to be in the same spot which ends up producing some really strange effects. The two electrons now start acting as this system. They basically become a kind of a joint system acquiring their own rules that are not really truly fermion rules and not truly boson rules. In other words, the system now becomes something completely different. It's neither fermion nor boson. And in this case, it even starts to meet all of the theoretical predictions and descriptions of the theory of anions. 
which basically suggests that by placing electrons in a two-dimensional environment and by forcing them to do things they shouldn't be able to do, we are able to create these quasi-states, these anion states, that acquire their own properties and start acting as a kind of a quasi-particle with its own new rules and its own physical properties. And that's what makes this somewhat unusual and also extremely interesting. And from the perspective of quantum computing, what makes anions especially interesting is that they seem to actually possess what's known as memory, especially when it comes to this twisting or this spinning that you see on the screen. And the easiest way to explain why this is important, let's take a look at this example again. So right here we have these two golf balls in this certain position. Let's just imagine that these are electrons, although that's probably not the best analogy here. Now we want to recreate this state again, so in order for us to do this, we actually have to have this ball move around once and I guess somewhere around here, we are now back to the original state. So after one spin, it's back to its original position and location, where we can kind of say that nothing has changed. But when it comes to these anions, this whole spin situation is a lot more complex. As a matter of fact, for a typical anion, theoretically at least, to return back to the original situation, original condition where it started, you would have to have anywhere from 3 to 5 to maybe even more spins. In other words, this whole spinning process can be used as a kind of a memory storage for a potential quantum computer. And this is exactly why Microsoft has been so exceptionally interested in this theory and has also been trying desperately to find a way to use these unusual quasi-particles to possibly create some kind of a super quantum computer that obviously no one really has any idea how to make just yet. And this type of a property is really important for any kind of a quantum computer, mostly because retention of information and also retention of any data in quantum computing is extremely hard. Quantum particles have a tendency to just do their own thing, they pop in and out of existence for example, they tend to have relatively low accuracy, but if you can find a way to control the actual memory of the quantum computer, and to have a system where the quantum information storage becomes more predictable, this changes the game completely. This now becomes a much more practical way of creating something that we can actually turn into, well, in some sense, another informational revolution, going from the classical computing age to the quantum computing age. And so according to this paper that you can find in the description below, this is exactly what the scientists in this paper were able to finally prove. They were finally able to show that anions indeed exist and seem to possess these properties that we kind of predicted they would have. And so in some sense they also discovered this third type of particles. But these particles are not really true particles, they are quasi-particles. They are just this new state of subatomic matter that only exists if other particles are already there. In some sense, you can think of it as, for example, a snowflake or any other complex shape. This shape by itself is formed by tiny water molecules that connect to one another in such a way that they actually form this very beautiful fractal formation. But this fractal by itself is a kind of a quasi-shape. It's a shape that arose out of the existence of other smaller particles. And that's kind of what anions are in a nutshell as well. They're not really particles by themselves. They only really become apparent and start existing when you take electrons, place them in two dimensions, add a lot of magnetic field to this, cool them down to practically absolute zero, and then have them interact with one another. That's when these anions become apparent and are basically formed by the collective behavior, collective action of these individual electrons. But practically speaking, we're still really far from our ability to use this knowledge and to use these resources to construct an actual computer. We're still years and possibly even decades away from even the first attempt to use all of this to create some kind of a practical quantum computer that can actually use this as a source of memory. Right now, all of this is very, very theoretical and still needs so much more work and so many more studies before all of this can come together and create something functional and something practical. I still remember how my entire understanding of the universe changed completely when I learned about and when I realized that you can indeed produce something out of nothing. Or in other words, you can actually create matter out of complete nothingness. Which by itself is already quite mind-blowing, but just the fact that it was proven so many times in the past makes this concept even more intriguing. And more importantly, it also transforms our understanding when it comes to the formation of the universe. There really did not have to be anything before the universe for it to actually suddenly form. 
But that's not really the entire point of this video, because today we're going to be talking about something slightly different. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing this relatively recent study you can find in the description below, that for the first time in history was able to physically reproduce what's known as the Schwinger effect. In a natural, finding a way to create particles, to create matter, by manipulating electromagnetic field. But before I talk more about the study, I guess let's get the basics first. So first of all, based on the iconic formula from Einstein, E equals mc square, we know that matter can become energy, but also energy can then turn into matter. I mean, for example, our sun, that produces fusion, works under the principle that some of the matter is going to be converted into pure energy. But theoretically, by having just enough energy in the limited amount of space, you can then turn this into various particles. Today this is often achieved in various very powerful particle accelerators that often do this by colliding things really fast with the collisions then producing huge amounts of energy. But let's just say you wanted to remove all of the possible particles and even all of the possible energy from existence, or at least from this picture. So basically imagine that we start removing all of the stars, all of the gas, all of the possibly invisible objects such as black holes and maybe some neutron stars, and eventually remove everything, including all of the energy. Basically we create what you would call empty space. And in this case, if there's really nothing here, no particles colliding, not even any kind of energy being produced, is anything going to ever form here? Well, the answer is actually yes. Even in the emptiness of the space that you see, the space itself is not going to be empty. It's going to be filled with what we refer to as quantum fields. And inside of these quantum fields, that essentially represents the entire universe, various particles and antiparticles are going to be constantly produced, but then annihilate themselves as soon as they essentially touch. Which means that even in perfect vacuum where there's basically nothing, no particles, no energy, no electromagnetic force, no gravity, the so-called maximum nothingness, we're still going to have various particle-antiparticle pairs always being created and always being eliminated. And there's a really famous experiment that proved this quite a while ago. And the experiment works as follows. Take any parallel plates, in this case conductive plates, and place them relatively close to one another. Now, theoretically, we only expect the force to be experienced between these plates to be gravity. Basically, the mass created by the plates should maybe attract them to one another. But nearly 80 years ago, the famous Dutch physicist Hendrik Casimir proposed an idea that was actually physically proven back in 1996, with the proof itself being available in the description below. He proposed that between these plates, there are actually going to be way less particle-antiparticle pairs being created, and because of this, we actually expect a kind of a pressure coming from the outside as if there was air pressure with more force pushing on the plates than you would expect from pure gravity. And something that was then proven several times in different studies. We know that Casimir effect seems to work, which means that the particle-antiparticle pairs are actually being created everywhere, even in complete vacuum when there is nothing there, the actual space is not really empty. There's always going to be some amount of field energy that's going to exist in every volume of empty space. But because of the weirdness of quantum mechanics and because of the uncertainty principle formula that you see right here, there is no true way to know how much energy or even where exactly all of this is going to be produced. As a matter of fact, some forces, such as electromagnetism and gravity, in theory at least, can actually act throughout the entire universe. They don't have a limitation on how far away they can act. And at least in theory, if the gravity or electromagnetism are strong enough, these forces can rip certain particles apart and as a result produce other particles out of complete vacuum. Or to be more exact, in theory we can actually induce these effects and produce these particles if you apply strong enough force, where in some sense you have quantum mechanics join the Einsteinian idea behind E equals mc square and turn some of this energy into actual matter. And when it comes to electromagnetism, the theory behind this is now known as the Schwinger effect, which in a nutshell says that if you have a really really strong electromagnetic field, the strength of the field itself is going to start ripping various particles and antiparticles out of vacuum and producing matter as a result. In this case, we expect various electrons and positrons to be spontaneously created in a very strong electromagnetic field. But this remained a theory for a very very long time, and for a very simple reason. Theoretically, it would require ridiculously strong polarization or extremely strong charge. In order to create these virtual particle-antiparticle pairs of the smallest possible particles, electrons and positrons, we would require powerful electric fields that have never been achieved in lab conditions. 
very similar in strength to what we find around various super super powerful objects such as neutron stars and certain types of black holes. And so even though in theory neutron stars could be doing this at all times, at least in some of the more extreme cases where the electric fields are just ridiculously powerful, here on Earth the situation is a little bit different. We just don't have any means to produce these very powerful fields, even using some of the most powerful reactors and lasers we have on the planet. And so for over 70 years this remained a theory, but that's until 2022. And in this case the scientists did something really clever. Instead of using three dimensions, they decided to rely on something in two dimensions, which would actually dramatically lower the amount of electric field needed to potentially observe these effects. And here it involved a really interesting setup using graphene a super strong material that basically is made out of carbon that's already known to produce a lot of intriguing effects with many of them discovered in the past. You might have heard of this material before because it produces some of the strongest things on the planet and it's even been suggested to be used in what we usually refer to as a space elevator. It's really strong enough to support everything by using what's known as a nanotube. But that's of course still in distant future. For now the scientists rely on the material's ability to essentially limit everything in two dimensions while at the same time also remaining extremely strong and practically unbreakable. And so because in this case they only had to deal with two dimensions and not three dimensions, the quantum particles that would be created here now had a lot less freedom and thus required much less powerful electromagnetic fields. And so by positioning these graphene sheets into what's known as a super lattice, with various layers creating periodic structures, and then applying the electric field to all of this, they were able to observe an interesting interaction that kind of mimicked Schwinger effect. But instead of producing electrons and positrons, the electrons that were occupying space here were producing electrons and empty holes, where these holes were flowing in the opposite direction. Something that graphene allowed the scientists to do because it's extremely strong and is also able to withstand very powerful electric fields as well. And although this wasn't a perfect observation of actual matter being produced by electric fields as suggested by the Schwinger effect theory, in essence this was the closest representation we can create on the planet without physically going to a neutron star and trying to do it there. Which of course serves as another important proof of the idea behind quantum theory and the idea that you can indeed create something out of nothing. Although in this case it does involve a little bit of the electric field, but it just confirms all of the other ideas and once again confirms all of our understanding of the particle physics, understanding of the quantum mechanics and also brings a bit of Einstein into this as well. But more importantly it once again confirms that our general ideas about the universe don't seem to be too wrong, I mean, basically they are correct after all. And the universe could have just started by itself without anything. And so particles can spontaneously create even if there is absolutely nothing present out there. And even completely empty space can never truly be empty. It's always going to have some particles and antiparticles produced no matter what. Well, let's start the video right here on Google Earth. I wanted to show you this very interesting guided tour that you can find here by typing CERN. A guided tour that essentially takes you to the largest particle collider on the planet, the CERN Collider. And here you can kind of explore what all of this looks like from the perspective of an engineer or a scientist working here. Or you can kind of zoom in exploring the city itself, admiring the entire infrastructure that was created in order to make this particular project operational. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be answering a question that I often get asked on the channel and didn't really get to answer before. The question being, why is it that we haven't really been able to create any black holes here on planet Earth? Could a particle collider produce a black hole? And would such a black hole be dangerous in any way to our planet? Something that appeared as a major concern for the last couple of decades ever since CERN became operational, with this article by NASA being particularly intriguing because of the title, The Day the World Didn't End. And all of this was because of several articles written in various uh, magazines back in the days that suggested that maybe in theory these particle colliders could actually produce some kind of a black hole that could maybe absorb everything on the planet and destroy planet Earth. But could any of this happen? Could these black holes be produced in the collider and could they actually destroy anything? Well, if you're about to click away from this video, the answer to all of these questions is no. But let me explain to you in more detail. So one of these concerns was actually because of how powerful CERN has become. It's currently able to collide 
different types of subatomic particles at ridiculously high velocities with extremely high energies. And in the last few years, as the scientists installed more and more upgrades on this particle accelerator, they were able to beat previous records, achieving higher and higher energies. Which in essence allows them to create a lot of other subatomic particles or exotic particles that could have been predicted by some studies or could have never been thought of before. And that's of course how the confirmation of the Higgs boson came to be as well. The existence of a subatomic particle that was very hypothetical until it was discovered approximately a decade ago. But every few years, the higher and higher energies are achieved and new records are established. Which at least in theory could allow the scientists doing all of this discover new unusual subatomic particles, new phenomena or potentially even new physics, something we've discussed in one of the previous videos from a few months ago that should be in the description. But early on, specifically in the first few years, there was a bit of a concern in regards to what could be created by these collisions. Could the scientists accidentally create something we don't really want to create on planet Earth? For example, could you somehow merge particles in order to create something extremely dense, something resembling a black hole? A black hole that starts small, but eventually absorbs the entire planet and everything around it as well. And that's why science communication as a field and as a profession is super important. Because very often people misunderstand certain concepts and very often associate certain words or certain principles with something that is not actually true. In this case, black holes. Many people today imagine a black hole as a kind of a vacuum cleaner with unlimited power. Something that is super, super powerful and something that essentially sucks up all of the matter around it. And something that, even though it could start small, would eventually absorb everything around it and expand, creating something even larger than before. But that's not actually what we believe black holes to be. And we don't actually think they do that at all. For example, in theory, you could turn anything into a black hole. You could take an apple or you can actually take yourself and condense yourself into a very, very dense mass that would then become a black hole. But in order for an apple or in this case you to become a black hole, it would actually have to be ridiculously small, even smaller than any subatomic particle. For example, you can use this calculator that you can find in the description to try to calculate how big of a black hole you would become based on your mass. In this case, an average adult would actually be a black hole of 10 to the power of minus 17 nanometers. And that's super, super, super small. Once again, that's smaller than most subatomic particles. On top of this, we know that black holes generally evaporate, and that's based on the Hawking radiation principle, something that was proposed uh, by iconic Stephen Hawking a few decades ago. And according to this calculator, the lifetime of this black hole would be 1 times 10 to the power of minus 11 seconds, a tiny, tiny fraction of a second before this black hole completely disappears, becoming just energy. And a black hole that's so small and a black hole that only exists for such a short period of time would not have time to do anything to anything around it. It would not be able to absorb any matter, it would not be able to do anything to any of the atoms or particles around it, and it would just disappear and nobody would know it even existed. But that's a black hole that's mass of a person. In this case, the amount of material used in these studies is minuscule. And so the size of this black hole decreases dramatically. And so does the total lifetime of this black hole. If ever such a black hole was created, it would actually exist for less than the universe allows. The minimum time frame we have is called Planck time. In this case, it seems to be below that limit. In other words, in terms of the modern understanding of how we think the universe works, it would not actually allow for this black hole to even exist, or if it did exist, it would probably break some laws of physics somewhere. But also because black holes don't work like vacuum cleaners, but actually work more like typical objects with typical mass, in this case it's all about gravity. So even an object that, for example, is your mass, or let's just say just an average adult, would not actually exert that much gravity on anything around it in order to absorb more mass or to add more mass to itself. Because the only way a black hole can increase in mass is if it actually starts adding more mass to itself through some sort of a collision. But because of the tiny size of this particular black hole, 
it would simply be incapable of touching anything or reaching anything. Its gravity is also very low, so it's not going to be attracting anything either. So even if a black hole was somehow created in some kind of a particle collider, it would just be insignificant. It would disappear without anyone ever knowing. And that's actually why it's almost impossible to currently answer the question of whether these black holes have ever been made on planet Earth. Even if they were created, they disappeared before anyone noticed. But also the question is, could it be created? Well, the answer to that is probably also no. Even though the collision energy between these particles is really high, it's still relatively low. As a matter of fact, some of the natural particle accelerators, such as various black holes, various very powerful explosions somewhere out there in the universe, produce particles with energy hundreds of millions of times higher than anything we can create here on planet Earth. And even natural particle accelerators in the magnetosphere of our planet, created by the interaction of the magnetosphere with the solar radiation, create something that's more powerful than we create in CERN. And so if black holes could be created anywhere, they are more likely to be created around our planet, not on it. But even here we don't think it's happening at all. And if it has ever been created on our planet or above our planet, well, there would be signs of this somewhere. Possibly signs of large explosions, large parts of matter missing, or something. As a matter of fact, there was an article I discussed last year that briefly talked about the hypothetical scenario where black holes could be colliding with our moon and there should be a way for us to detect them by using modern calculations of various craters. So far nothing, but still possible. But if by some chance CERN does create a black hole, based on current calculations of the total mass used, it would only be approximately 5 times 10 to the power of minus 20 grams. Once again creating a black hole that's just impossible, both in terms of the time that it would exist and even in terms of the total size it's actually below the allowed total length. It's lower than one Planck length, the smallest size that the universe currently allows. According to this calculator, here is the smallest amount of material needed for a black hole to actually exist in terms of the length. And in this case, it's going to exist for a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the time. It's equivalent to about 11 micrograms, or the amount of material you sometimes find written on, for example, a vitamin pill bottle. And that's way more material and way more total mass than the scientists actually use inside these particle accelerators. Because of the amount of energy required, the total mass here is much, 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 much lower. And as you can see from this calculation, the total size of this black hole is also minuscule. So there's absolutely no way it can ever affect anything around it. Now, it might still be affected by gravity of planet Earth, but even as it travels through our planet, it's unlikely to touch anything or unlikely to interact with any of the particles either. But even if it did absorb some of the particles as it moved through the planet, it would still only absorb several thousand different particles, increasing its mass by just a tiny fraction. In other words, it would not turn into this supermassive black hole that would destroy everything. And if it keeps absorbing more and more mass as it travels through the planet, it would actually take it a pretty long time before it becomes anything significant. In order for this black hole to become large enough to finally affect anything around it, it would probably need trillions and trillions of years of traveling through the planet and constantly absorbing mass. But because of the Hawking radiation, it's most likely going to evaporate faster than it's going to have a chance to absorb something else. And so in order to create a stable black hole that's going to exist long enough for it to start absorbing mass from the planet and to possibly even grow larger and larger in size, you would need to have an initial mass of at least several billion tons. Because without this mass, it's going to become unstable and then evaporate. But if there is a black hole that's several billion tons in mass, in that case, it can actually start absorbing mass around it and grow larger and larger. Something that the scientists think might exist out there, something we refer to as primordial black holes, and something the scientists have used to explain the hypothetical dark matter that might exist in the universe. At the moment, all of this is still hypothetical, and none of this is certainly known. And since none of the particle accelerators on the planet can accelerate so much mass all at once, creating anything similar to this, we don't actually have to worry about some kind of a black hole destroying planet Earth. At worst, even if the black hole is created, it's going to disappear before anyone can even notice. But at best, there's just not enough mass for the universe to even allow for this black hole to exist. We can create other particles, subatomic particles, but we cannot create 
a black hole that's going to exist because either its total size or its total time of existence is beyond the Planck length or the Planck time. The minimal length and the minimal time allowed by the universe itself. And so that's why CERN or other particle accelerators did not end the planet when they started operating. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some relatively incredible but somewhat unexplored discovery that came from the Jefferson Lab located in the US. The lab whose main purpose is to investigate the nature of matter itself with the scientists in this lab doing so by trying to learn as much as they can about various subatomic particles. And so if we have the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope exploring the universe and looking at the universe from the outside perspective, on the other side we have scientists from the Jefferson lab doing the opposite, looking on the inside in order to understand how the world on the inside looks like as well. And naturally there are quite a lot of these labs around the world, a lot of them usually deal with particle physics and use a lot of different particle accelerators to try to get the data, but in this particular case the scientists in this lab have actually accidentally discovered something amazing about the mass in the universe. At least amazing for the particle physicists. But before I talk about this and what the scientists found here, I actually wanted to bring up several other articles that I did not cover on this channel for a very important reason. And the reason is really simple. There's unfortunately a bit of a divide nowadays between the actual discovery in various scientific papers and how the media portrays it, usually through very clickbaity titles. Now, my apologies for possibly doing this in the past as well, mostly because I didn't really realize how misleading this can actually be in the long term, but here's one good example from just a few months ago. An article from Boston College published this press release claiming to have discovered an elusive particle with the material containing something they refer to as the axial Higgs mode. And all of this got picked up by the media pretty quickly, and this axial Higgs boson eventually even got its own Wikipedia page. Luckily for us, this page no longer exists because this axial Higgs boson is not really what the scientists found in that paper. And the paper itself doesn't even mention any specific particles. As a matter of fact, it mentions something completely unrelated to the iconic Higgs boson. But one thing led to another, and eventually this news spread, with quite a lot of different sources picking it up. And I actually wasn't sure how to cover this, but eventually realized that, well, this is not obviously the first time this happened. And by the way, nothing particularly exciting was discovered in this paper, nothing revolutionary or nothing related to the Higgs boson. So yeah, axial Higgs boson is not a thing. But speaking of Higgs boson, I'm pretty sure most of you have heard about this, because back in 2012, this was the biggest scientific hype. The discovery of a subatomic particle, the particle that was even described as the gut particle that essentially makes mass in the universe happen. The particle named after Peter Higgs, who predicted its existence back in the days. But the thing is, even back in 2012, this was a bit of a over-exaggeration and the hype that should not have happened. I'm not entirely sure why it went out of control, but the discovery itself was also not super groundbreaking for one important reason. Higgs boson only actually explains 1% of mass of everything. It does not explain all of the mass in the universe. And so even though it was called the gut particle, it's basically only 1% gut particle. It only gives mass to very specific subatomic particles, the ones responsible for the weak force, W and Z boson specifically. Which is one of the reasons why Peter Higgs was really disappointed about how much attention all of this got. But what's a little bit more unfair, and I guess somewhat more surprising, is that the new discovery from the Jefferson lab received practically no attention anywhere, even though it was a much bigger discovery than the Higgs boson. And more importantly, it actually kind of explains 99% of all of the mass in the universe. Alright, let's step a few steps back and talk about the mass. Actually, it's a really strange concept. Now, obviously most of us have some kind of an understanding of what mass is, but I think, conceptually, it's more or less different for everyone. Now, first of all, weight is not the same as mass. When you weigh yourself on a scale, you're getting mass times acceleration. Not really the same concept. However, your mass is still the same even if you go to space where the acceleration is a little bit different. As a matter of fact, in one of the older videos, I even explored the idea of having a tiny object orbit around you because both you and the object will have mass. And so if you're in space and you put an object relatively close to you, it eventually can acquire an orbit around you. 
that older video should be somewhere in the description. And obviously, as the object becomes more massive, it sort of acquires more gravity and starts attracting objects even more. The most extreme example in this case is of course a black hole, an object whose mass is just way way too much, even the light cannot escape it. But the question is still, so okay, what exactly is mass though? Where is it coming from? Well, I guess one way to answer this is to look inside the atoms and inside the particles that all these objects are made from. For example, here's a helium atom. We have the electron cloud around it, but a lot of its mass is concentrated in the middle where you see two red protons and two neutrons. The mass of the electron in this case can generally be ignored, it's relatively small. And so it looks like most of the mass in this atom comes from the protons and the neutrons. But then if you start zooming in even more, you will discover that both the proton and the neutron are made out of their own subatomic particles. We refer to them as quarks. For the protons and the neutrons, the quarks are up quarks and down quarks. This here is a proton, this here is a neutron. A very very small difference, with this being a result of the weak force. But we've discussed this in one of the previous videos, that should be in the description. Ok, so where's the mass though? Well, here's the thing. When the scientists a few decades ago started to measure the mass of these quarks, specifically the up quarks and down quarks separately, and they did so by conducting a lot of particle accelerator experiments where they collide a lot of different particles, creating subatomic particles and observing the effects, they quite shockingly discovered that the up quarks and down quarks only represent a tiny fraction of the total mass. Yet the proton itself and the neutron itself were much 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 more massive than they should have been if it was just the up quarks and the down quarks. So where is the mass from? And well, in the last few decades the scientists were finally able to kind of answer this. With the work from the Jefferson lab right here, more or less answering this once and for all. And more importantly, even creating a beautiful simulation to kind of help us visualize all of this and to help us understand where most of the mass or 99% of all of the mass in the universe, and we're talking about mass inside various stars, inside various gas clouds, and in pretty much most of the objects out there, comes from. And the actual answer and the result are kind of counterintuitive and somewhat difficult to understand. It comes from the gluons connecting everything together. It comes from these squiggly lines. And this particular image doesn't really do it justice because most of the mass of the entire proton and the neutron is in these squiggly lines. This mass comes from the energy connecting and holding the quarks together. Or at least that's one way of thinking about it. The much better way of visualizing this is through this new simulation. So here's how we previously imagined the proton. We have three quarks interacting with one another with essentially a force holding them together. But in reality, the proton and the neutron would probably look something like this, with all of these white patches you see, essentially creating these large clouds of gluons that then carry the strong force which essentially creates the mass. And this by itself is, to me at least, kind of mind-blowing. And since individual quarks in this case are only responsible for less than 1% of the total mass, it's really these gluons that create pretty much all of the mass around us, not Higgs boson, not the tiny quarks inside of our bodies, but the strong force holding them together. But wait, it gets even more counterintuitive and weird. It's not the gluons themselves, it's the energy of binding. And I guess more specifically, the motion of the gluons and their speed. By themselves, each individual gluon doesn't actually have much mass at all. When the scientists originally measured individual gluons through various particle accelerator experiments, they determined that its mass was absolutely minuscule. So once again, where is the mass coming from? Well, it turns out, gluons are mostly massless at short distances. But as they travel further away, they tend to acquire mass. Or I guess to be more exact, they acquire the binding energy, which then binds the quarks together. And in this case, the scientists believe it's because the quarks tend to gather the clouds of gluons as they move across larger distances. And so even though the mass of the individual quark is small and the mass of individual gluon is minuscule as well, the motion of the gluons creates all the mass on the inside. And so this weird cloud you see, that's gluons moving around creating the mass inside the proton. And honestly, even today, I personally have trouble sort of wrapping my head around this. How exactly can mass be formed by the unusual interaction of these gluons and essentially by them just moving around and then somehow binding quarks together 
and thus generating the mass in the entire universe, 99% of all of the mass. Which then obviously generates things like gravity, which generates a lot of other effects we observe around the universe. Very hard to conceptualize, somewhat difficult to understand, but thanks to the scientists from the Jefferson Lab and the MIT, we now have a slightly better visualization, allowing us to kind of see this and allowing us to kind of understand what's happening, at least to some extent. But that's actually not the new discovery. The most recent discovery, from I guess just a few weeks ago, is more or less accidental. And it's from this study right here you can find in the description below. And all this comes from a completely different experiment that was actually shooting various electrons at various protons and neutrons designed to study proton and neutron spin. In other words, the scientists were actually studying something entirely different, but they were doing so for nearly a decade. And so over this period of time, they've collected a huge amount of data about protons, electrons, and neutrons. And recently they realized that they could actually combine all this information to extract the overall strong force coupling and how it affects protons and neutrons on the inside. In simpler terms, by combining all of this data from these experiments, they were actually able to see what's happening to these squiggly lines. And specifically, they were able to calculate how the strong force changes as the distance between quarks grows as well. Mostly because it's still not entirely clear if the force grows exponentially, if it stays the same, or if it maybe decreases because of the distances. And in this case, the scientists were able to calculate the strong force at the largest distances yet, determining that at larger distances, the strong force seems to actually stay the same. Whereas at shorter distances, it's relatively weak. Which also proves that gluons in this case also get their mass from the force of coupling. Or basically that 99% of all of the mass in the universe is formed by the force that's holding things together. And in case of these squiggly lines, once they get far enough away from each other, the force between them will stay relatively same. But even though this is a pretty major breakthrough, it still is far from actually explaining everything about mass to us and there are still so many unanswered questions. As a matter of fact, not so long ago, we've even discussed some of these potential problems discovered in the particle physics that could maybe rewrite some of these ideas. A few days ago, I read an article with a somewhat tricky and somewhat attention-capturing name. Could we create a neutron star on planet Earth? Could we make this somewhere on the planet? Probably not a good idea, but still an interesting concept. And although creating an actual neutron star would be practically impossible on the planet, creating a matter resembling a neutron star, or basically neutron matter, is a possibility. And that's exactly what we're talking about based on a very recent study. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton. And today we're going to be discussing what seems to be an actual proof that the scientists were able to create new type of matter, neutron matter, right here on planet Earth. A very hypothetical type of matter known as tetraneutron, which up until now was thought to be still impossible. And it's actually a really exciting discovery that has the potential of opening so many doors for future sciences. But let's take baby steps. So why exactly is this so important, and what exactly would this neutron matter be? Well, here's the thing. If we look around the universe, the vast, vast majority of everything, most of the matter here, is essentially proton matter. It sort of resembles this. It's one single proton surrounded by an electron. And this, of course, creates hydrogen. But in order to create pretty much all of the other elements, you have to start adding something else. You have to start adding neutrons. And so here, as you can see, a typical helium atom would contain two protons and two neutrons, with other elements depending on a very similar concept as well. With every single proton, you kind of have to start having more neutrons in there as well. And the principle here is really simple. If you want to have a stable atom, you do need to have neutrons somewhere on the inside. With the only exception being the hydrogen atom that only contains a single proton. And when you start breaking atoms apart, so for example during the nuclear fission, that's when the reaction ends up producing more neutrons, and it also becomes the primary contributor to what's known as the nucleosynthesis. In other words, during any kind of a nuclear reaction, these free neutrons can now actually move around and possibly join some other atoms in order to create something a little bit more complex, producing heavier and more complex elements in the process making the neutron capture an essential process in the production of, well, pretty much all of the matter in the universe that's not hydrogen, while also making neutrons absolutely essential for the production of nuclear power. 
The idea we refer to as the nuclear chain reaction is essentially a bunch of neutrons colliding with other atoms and causing complex atoms such as uranium to fall apart, releasing even more neutrons in the process. And when the scientists discovered this in the early 30s, it actually led to the production of the first ever self-sustaining nuclear reactor known as the Chicago Pile 1. And so neutrons are super super important, but the thing is they don't seem to exist outside of the atom for longer than 15 minutes. Or to rephrase this, a single neutron outside of an atom is really going to only exist for roughly around 15 minutes before changing into a proton and an electron. Any kind of a neutron matter existing somewhere out there would most likely instantly convert into hydrogen. Basically because neutrons would create protons and electrons, which would then very likely combine, creating hydrogen. But that's of course unless you apply extreme conditions. Such as for example so much pressure created by so much gravity that the protons and electrons start to recombine back into neutrons, forming these extremely dense objects that we today refer to as the neutron stars. Unusual objects that seem to be responsible for so many different mysteries around the universe. For example, fast radio bursts are now believed to be produced by neutron stars. I guess magnetars to be more specific. And magnetars by themselves already have so many mysteries about them. But this seems to be the only stable way for neutrons to exist. Outside of the atom, that is. It's always been believed that outside of a neutron star, it would be practically impossible to create any kind of neutron matter. Matter that would maybe even combine to create something more complex and create various objects that would not just be neutron stars, objects that could even exist in your typical room conditions. But there's always been this one theory that suggested that because of various quantum effects, in theory you could maybe have a neutron matter as well. In other words, there was a suggestion that, well, you could maybe have neutron gas, or you might have neutron objects out there, possibly even neutron planets. I mean, that's a very, very sort of hypothetical idea, but it was always there. And one of the initial proponents of this idea is Dr. James Very, currently in the Iowa State University, that started doing experiments on this back in 2002, so 20 years ago. And it was initially theorized that any kind of a reaction involving beryllium could maybe produce what's known as a tetraneutron. Essentially, a collection of four neutrons that kind of, sort of, hold each other through various quantum effects without causing the entire system to fall apart and without causing the formation of protons and electrons. However, in this case, this would maybe only last for a fraction of a second. At least that was the initial idea behind this. But because these neutrons would use what's known as the resonance to try to hold themselves together, if we were to add more tetraneutrons in there, chances are they might actually stabilize the system with more tetraneutrons, creating a much more stable environment. And thus potentially creating stable objects on a larger scale. Now at least one experiment in 2016 in Japan suggested that there were possibly signs of tetraneutrons found in their experiment using different types of helium. But it was very difficult to confirm this and not a lot of scientists were sort of behind this idea. Nevertheless, this was an exciting prospect because, well, it was basically creating exotic matter right here on planet Earth. It would be subatomic particles that have no charge and might contain properties that would be very useful in existing or emerging technologies. But the scientists obviously kept trying. And because the original calculations using various supercomputers were able to determine the exact parameters for these tetraneutrons, including their energy, their physical parameters, and what sort of emissions they're going to be producing, all the scientists had to do now is use various particle colliders to try to see if anything like that appears in any of the data. And looks like this new experiment, once again from Japan, might have discovered it and confirmed it after all. Identifying some kind of a particle that was produced in the process with the energy signature extremely similar to the one predicted by the original supercomputer calculations. And although it is possible that this is maybe something entirely different, because of the similarity with the original predictions, the best current explanation is that this was the neutron matter after all. And to be more specific, those four neutrons connected to one another through the process of quantum resonance, with no protons and no electrons needed. With the new question being, can you combine these into more particles, creating something more stable that can actually sustain itself for much longer periods of time, or possibly even creating a larger structure? In other words, can we actually have neutron objects? Objects made entirely out of neutrons and nothing else. And obviously, unlike a typical neutron star, not being super dense and not possessing huge amounts of gravity objects with similar properties to what we are used to around us. And if so, and if it actually does create stability by adding more of these together, 
This has a possibility of creating completely new matter physics and possibly even new types of engineering that could lead to completely new technologies. I mean, at the moment, nobody even knows what any of this is going to create just yet. But it's of course assuming that by adding more of these particles, we can create something more stable. At the moment, all of this is still uncertain because this is a brand new discovery. But I guess to answer the question of whether you can create a neutron star here on planet Earth, the answer, for now at least, seems to be yes, as long as it's relatively low in density and uses a very specific type of a quantum resonance in order to keep these neutrons from falling apart and from essentially turning into protons and electrons. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about ice. But things about ice you probably didn't know, and types of ice you may have never heard of before. We're still going to be talking about water ice, but different type of water ice. Extraterrestrial water ice. So let's discuss some of these new discoveries, including the most recent study that just found yet another type of ice we didn't know existed. And let's start with the idea of ice, water ice. So here on planet Earth, when liquid water reaches a certain temperature, it starts to freeze into a solid, becoming what we call ice. And as you probably know by now, we've been finding water, and specifically water ice, in a lot of different places around the galaxy and even around the universe. Here in our home in the solar system, ice seems to be abundant, and it seems to be pretty much everywhere. For example, water ice has been discovered in the darkest places on Mercury, which is very close to the sun, and nobody really expected to find any water ice here. We also obviously have water ice located right here, one of the poles of planet Mars. And just generally, in pretty much most of the locations around the solar system, most of the objects in the Oort Cloud, most of the objects in any region of the solar system are going to have at least some water ice in them. And even beyond the solar system, we've discovered the interstellar ice also pretty much everywhere. But is it the same type of ice that we are used to? Is it the same type of ice that we have here on Earth? And the answer to that is not really. As a matter of fact, it's very different. It's still water and it's still ice, but just very different in structure and in properties. And all of this usually depends on what conditions this water ice is made in. For example, is it produced under a lot of pressure, no pressure or same pressure as on Earth? Is it produced really quickly or really slowly? Are there any other types of radiation involved here? And essentially all of this depends on how the atoms and how the molecules themselves start to arrange and what sort of shapes they start to create. Now, for the ice we're used to, the one that's on Earth, if you were to really zoom into the structure of this ice, you would discover something that creates these very beautiful hexagonal shapes that is generally produced as this water molecule starts to arrange itself in these hexagonal shapes based on the arrangement of the oxygen atoms with the hydrogen atom being more disorderly and more or less forming amorphous shapes and not really having any order at all. And so these hexagonal shapes are generally formed because of the oxygen arrangement, with molecules connecting to one another using electrostatic forces, but with hydrogen atoms not really having as much of a structure or as much of a dependence on one another. And because of this, scientists sometimes refer to ice on Earth as hydrogen disordered ice, so the only order present in those crystals is based on the oxygen molecules, nothing else. Which surprisingly allows this type of ice to have very unique properties, properties that scientists believe were absolutely crucial for the development of life on the planet. But first of all, because of this hexagonal formation, that's why a lot of ice crystals, and specifically things like snowflakes, start to produce various beautiful six-sided patterns. And so all of this is based on the idea of a six-sided structure that's formed by the oxygen atoms. And because inside this type of ice only oxygen and not hydrogen have any order, one of the major properties of ice on Earth is that it can actually kind of flow. That's for example why a glacier is able to slowly flow down the mountain instead of just crumbling and falling apart like a typical crystal would. And so this hydrogen disorder is absolutely crucial for the properties of ice on Earth or ice one as it's known in science. So this ice one surprisingly is unique to planet Earth. At least for now, we haven't been able to discover it in a lot of other places. But there is a lot of other ice and it's definitely not the same as the ice on planet Earth. The ice on other objects and other planets and other dwarf planets like Pluto will actually be in some way different, usually more orderly. 
or in this case even the hydrogen atoms will start stacking in such a way that they create very specific orderly crystals. Although in some cases it's actually quite the opposite. In some cases we also have something known as amorphous ice which has no order whatsoever and literally just easily flows across everything. And so officially there were actually 18 different types of ices. Everything from ice 1 up until ice 18. With ice 18 being this really strange type of water known as super ionic water where first the water molecules break apart and oxygen becomes ionized then starts forming a very specific structure, but the hydrogen atoms stay around and kind of form this unusual freely flowing structure on the inside. And although here on Earth we can usually only produce these in the lab using really extreme pressures, a lot of scientists today believe that a lot of this ice exists in objects like Neptune and Uranus because they do have a lot of strange ionic water on the inside. So this type of ice does definitely exist somewhere out there in the solar system. But generally a lot of other types of ice that exist out there differ from one another because they can form hydrogen bonds in a very specific, very unique way. And this creates ice that's extremely brittle. It breaks really easily. Now it's very difficult to kind of imagine this, but in some way imagine ice that instead of just kind of slowly flowing in your hand, ends up cracking and breaking and kind of turning into dust almost immediately. And generally, the structure of each of these ices and of course the properties of each of these ices are going to be very different. With most of them being very mysterious because only tiny amounts of them have so far been produced in a typical lab environment. But now, only a few weeks ago from when I'm making this video, a team of scientists was able to create another type of ice. The ice we refer to as ice 19. With a general structure that kind of looks like this, where hydrogen is also just as ordered as oxygen. Or more scientifically speaking, instead of a hexagonal ice we find on Earth, the normal ice we're used to, this is a tetragonal crystalline phase that can only form in very special conditions, very cold temperatures and also very very high pressures. In this particular case, the scientists were able to create this using another form of ice known as ice 15 and then cooling this down to about minus 170 degrees Celsius and increasing the pressure to about 20,000 atmospheres. Which, by the way, is also something we find inside planets like Neptune and Uranus. These conditions, especially inside Uranus, which is slightly cooler, are pretty common all over the planet. But what's interesting in this particular discovery is that the scientists were also able to connect and in some cases relate several different types of ice, realizing that they only differ in terms of the location of hydrogen atoms, not the oxygen atoms. And specifically ice 6, 15 and 19 are very very similar to each other but the hydrogen atoms are arranged a little bit differently. Although the natural assumption here is that they will also probably have different properties. They have a relatively similar density, not exactly the same though, but the properties or basically how the ice reacts to the environment around itself are going to be very different. Obviously we don't really know what they are yet but they're different. Also original ice that all of this is made from, which is ice 6, can actually be formed in a normal temperature but it still has to be at very high pressures. Or in this particular case it has to be about minus 3 degrees Celsius with about 1.1 gigapascal of pressure. Or about 11,000 times more pressure than on the surface of planet Earth. Pressures which usually exist inside various gas giants but are very unlikely to exist on the surface of a terrestrial planet or a dwarf planet. And one of the more interesting implications from the study is that it seems that this polymorphous ice can transition from one phase to another naturally depending on the pressure. And that's of course something that we kind of expect to very likely happen inside of these very very large gas giants, specifically places like Uranus. Here the pressures are very high, the temperatures are super low, and a lot of the atmosphere always circulates stuff around on the inside. So a lot of water that's present here most likely goes through these transitions all the time. But how it affects the actual planet and what happens on the inside, that's a mystery we have no answer to. With I guess the biggest mystery here being, can you actually form some sort of a maybe Earth-like life based on the ice and water present in these conditions? Because right now what all of this implies is that the ice and the water on Earth are very unique and that's maybe why life exists here but does it exist on other places like Enceladus, Titan and so on? And so all of this water that forms the surface of Enceladus for example, all of this ice you see here, that's very different from the ice on Earth. 
It's not entirely clear what type of ice this is, but it definitely has different properties, different action, and of course different interaction with everything around it compared to what we have on Earth. And so various types of water we discover around the universe, all of this really depends on the structure itself, the structure of the molecules as they crystallize. But more specifically, all of this really depends on the structure of hydrogen atoms. How the hydrogen atoms align seems to determine what sort of ice we get at the end. And when they align randomly, we get the ice we get on planet Earth. And all this is of course really important in order for us to understand what happens on these various objects in the solar system and beyond. The majority of these objects, including the one you see right here, the moon Europa, are not made of the water ice from planet Earth. This is also this polymorphous ice we are able to create in the lab, but that doesn't exist on Earth. Although, okay, not entirely true. There's one type of ice that exists on Earth that possibly also exists in space, and that's the Type 7 ice. The type of water ice that occasionally finds itself inside different diamonds produced in extreme pressures inside planet Earth. Those conditions do create polymorphous ice in tiny, tiny amounts inside diamonds. But in outer space, the so-called hexagonal ice, the ice we're used to, is almost non-existent. Most of the ice that we'll usually find around various objects is either going to be amorphous, having no structure whatsoever, or is going to be a tetragonal, containing extreme structures. And so that's why learning more about different types of water ice outside of planet Earth is actually important, because it does seem like a lot of this ice on Earth is extremely unique. It's not amorphous, it's not tetragonal, and it has very unique properties that are absent in some of the other ices we've discovered. Properties that are absolutely crucial for life on Earth to survive and to thrive. And so the creation of ICE-19 and this discovery in general is actually really important scientifically speaking. But now, as the scientists mentioned in the paper, there's a quest for ICE-20. What's going to be the next ICE they discover? And the other curious question I guess we all have is, how many ices are possible after all? Is it going to be a really, really huge number? Or will hydrogen have a very specific number of patterns available to it depending on the structure of oxygen? And that's something scientists might be able to answer in the next few decades, but right now it's a big mystery and nobody really knows. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about water. Because something unusual, something extremely extraordinary, has been recently discovered about water itself. And we're not talking about ice water or water in some strange states, we're talking about liquid water, the water that's present on the planet. And what recently has been discovered suggests that water itself seems to possess two different states depending on the temperature. And that is something that nobody really expected to find. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Because as you can probably imagine, water is probably one of the most important substances for life at least on planet Earth. And this is something that we actually need to understand really well if we do one day want to discover some kind of other life somewhere out there. In order to understand the origins of life and of course how life evolved on planet Earth. So first of all we know that water is already kind of strange. And by the way when I say water I don't mean just liquid water, I mean water itself as a molecule and as an element on the periodic table of elements. For example, this is the only known substance to us where the solid state, the ice as it's known, actually floats on the liquid state. In pretty much every other known case, the liquid state normally floats on top of the solid state. So this is, for example, the case with things like methane, ethane, and so on. But for some unknown to us reasons, in case of water, the ice is, well, it's less dense. It seems to be able to float on the surface of the liquid state of water. Now, obviously, this is something we've all learned in school and something we kind of all take for granted, but with other liquids, this is not the case at all. For some reason, the liquid water, when it freezes, when it becomes solid, starts to expand. And this is not really easy to explain. Also, when it comes to things like boiling or essentially becoming gas, normally the more molecular weight the molecule has, the higher its boiling point. So for water in this case, we would expect it to have much, much lower boiling point. But its boiling point is extremely high, suggesting that it has much stronger bonds than some of the other molecules. But that's of course some of the things that you might have already learned in school and some of the things that you might already understand. Because we know that overall, water does seem to be a very strange substance. 
But these strange facts about water is not really something we can answer right now. There's still a lot of things we don't understand about the substance. There are, however, things that we've all learned in school, which is, of course, the states of matter, the states of water. We probably all still remember that we are taught that water has three states, ice, liquid water, and gas. And in this case, you can actually see two of them. You see the clouds above and you see the liquid water, which is the ocean here. But what they didn't teach us in school is that water actually has a lot more states, way, way more than we can actually list in this video. For example, we already discovered close to 20 different states of ice, basically the solid form, and they all seem to be different depending on the structure of the molecules inside the ice itself. For example, this form right here, known as ice 10, forms at really, really high pressures and creates a somewhat interesting, very symmetric ice compared to normal ice we see on Earth. And most of these ice forms are normally formed in usually somewhat extreme conditions or, in many cases, in outer space. So, for example, ice we find on comets or on other planetary objects structurally and possibly even functionally is not really the same ice as we have here on Earth. The ice on Earth is very unique and very different from the things we find in outer space. And these different forms of ice have been discovered for many, many years now, and we're probably going to be discovering a lot more of them in the future. But in this case, this is not particularly difficult to explain. As the water solidifies, as it becomes solid, water molecules can actually assume different types of shapes. Like not so long ago, only a couple of years ago, the Japanese scientists discovered that water can actually create this extremely light type of ice, the so-called ultra-density ice, that the scientists also refer to as aero ice, mostly because it's very, very light compared to the typical ice we find on planet Earth. But that's for ices. On the opposite side of the spectrum, if we start warming up the water, and if we make it extremely hot and extremely energized, we can also create what's known as plasma water, and we've discovered at least one potential planet where the atmosphere might be filled with this plasma water. And this is water that's essentially more closer to fire than it is to actual substance, to actual water. And so there are a lot of these extreme examples to show you that water has a lot of different states, many of which are obviously not taught in schools. But here's the thing though, what about the liquid water? It turns out that even the liquid water is extremely surprising and completely unexpected in what it can do. It turns out that the liquid water on our planet has two states, and this is something we had no idea existed until, well, basically only a few months ago. Because all of this came from this particular study you can find in the description below. And turns out all of this starts happening as you start warming up the water. Somewhere between 40 and 60 degrees Celsius, or 104 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the water starts acquiring these unusual properties it did not have when it was colder. It literally starts switching between two different liquid states. And both liquid states, the colder water and the warmer water, have very different physical properties that can be calculated, measured, and can most likely affect other systems around them. And all of this starts happening as soon as water reaches that temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius. So first of all, around 50 degrees Celsius, the refraction of water, the refractive index as it's known, changes to the point where it becomes observable. Refraction in this case refers to the property of various substances where they actually change the angle of incoming light when the light goes from one medium to another. And it looks like at around 50 degrees Celsius, the refractive index of liquid water changes as well, as if it became something a little bit different from what it used to be. And then around 53 degrees Celsius, it starts to also change its conductivity. And although normally conductivity in water can be changed by adding, for example, different salts, in this case, we're talking about pure water. And the pure water also changes conductivity once it reaches a certain temperature, around 53 degrees in this case. Now, one property of water that's very unusual and also kind of hard to explain is the so-called surface tension. It's basically how strong the molecules hold on to each other to create a kind of a, almost like a film on top of the water. It's not really a true film, but it's what we refer to as the surface tension. And this also changes, quite surprisingly, around the temperature of about 57 degrees. And although in this case, maybe that's something to do with the fact that there's now more energy in the water because of the heat, it still is extremely difficult to explain. And then around 64 degrees Celsius, it finally changes the last property, which is thermal conductivity. So in other words, by the time it reaches that 64 degree mark, it has changed at least four different properties, in some sense, almost like becoming a completely different substance from what it used to be when it was colder. 
it practically becomes a different liquid. And this is not something anyone expected. This is not something the scientists actually were expecting to discover at all. But most importantly, this has huge implications on life and also evolution of life. Remember, today we believe that life on Earth evolved approximately three and a half, maybe even four billion years ago. And this is when Earth was very different. It was a lot warmer. The water was also a lot warmer. And chances are it was actually much warmer than possibly even 64 degrees Celsius. In other words, the liquid water that was present on early Earth was very, very likely in that other state we just kind of discovered. The thermal conductivity, the electrical conductivity, refractive index, and surface tension were most likely a lot different from what they are today. And in some sense, maybe this is actually what helped life to evolve. We obviously can't really explain what exactly it was that helped life to evolve, but it does seem like maybe this actually has some sort of a correlation. The different state of liquid water present on early Earth may have assisted early life on Earth to create all of the necessary components for later life to evolve. Now, this is not something we can easily prove just yet, but there is definitely a lot of implications in this discovery. And although we don't really have any good explanations yet, the potential explanation here is really all to do with the unusual bond that water uses to essentially maintain its shape. The bond we refer to as the hydrogen bond. And because this bond is used by so many other organic molecules, including things like proteins, and because it's so extremely important in regulation and maintenance of activity inside the living cells, for example, this of course also suggests that whatever was happening on early Earth when water was warmer was probably extremely different from what's happening on Earth today. And so now it's actually super important to take into consideration the temperature of liquid water on potential other objects we discover somewhere out there. Because water seems to have very different effects in very different temperatures, all of this officially has now become even more complicated than before. But what's really interesting here is that we keep discovering all of these incredible things about water and we keep realizing how absolutely incredible this substance is. It seems to be absolutely unique in the universe, in all of its properties, in all of its abilities, but most importantly, of course, in its ability to create organic life and to sustain it for many, many billions of years. And this is, of course, one of the many reasons we're studying all of this, because we want to understand how life was created, how life evolved, and what exactly was the role of water in all of this. But anyway, it's a really, really exciting discovery, probably one of the bigger discoveries of the last few years, but the implications of this discovery are not really going to be instantly apparent to us. It's probably going to take a lot of studies and a lot of new discoveries to try to figure out what all of this means. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing yet another unusual phenomenon on the planet, the picture from which you see right here, this was taken in Hawaii a few years ago, that the scientists might have actually finally kind of explained, at least to some extent. And in this case, this is an electrical phenomenon kind of related to the lightning, something that's familiar to most of us, but at the same time represents a kind of an upside down lightning that goes into space instead of hitting planet Earth. And so in this video, we're going to be taking a slightly deeper look at some of these electrical phenomena on the planet and specifically figuring out what we know and don't know about them. And actually that second part, not knowing, is a lot bigger than knowing. We sort of understand how lightning works, the one that you see right here, although obviously even here there are quite a lot of mysteries. But the thing is, back in 1989, Completely by accident, some of the cameras, for the first time ever, caught some other phenomena that nobody knew existed until then. And since then, in the last three decades, quite a few of them have been discovered, confirmed, and to some extent, maybe explained but not very thoroughly, helping the scientists realize that lightning by itself is just a tip of an iceberg. In reality, when it comes to various lightning phenomena, there are quite a lot of them happening in various layers of the atmosphere and some of them are actually way more powerful than anything we experience here on the planet, on the surface of the planet. For example, quite a lot of various photographs have captured this. These are usually known as sprites. And sprites have been seen in a lot of different videos from various organizations, including NASA's cameras. As a matter of fact, you can often see these sprites in a lot of different observations from the International Space Station. 
Then, a bit more recently, the scientists in Canada identified a much more recent phenomenon that's now referred to as STEVE, Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. These phenomena are also quite different from a typical lightning and generally seem to appear around the same time when the solar activity increases, which often leads to a lot of aurora as well. Although obviously even today there are still a lot of mysteries about its origins and the actual way that it works. It's a very recent phenomenon and a lot of scientists are still struggling to understand it. Then we have these phenomena that often start in the atmosphere and head towards space. Here's one such example. Today they are sort of referred to as elves. And these phenomena are also still not entirely well understood, but they also might be kind of related to how these jets form as well. But in this video I really wanted to focus on the most powerful one, the one that scientists usually refer to as the gigantic jets. This obviously being one example. And so unlike Steve, unlike elves and sprites, the gigantic jets, as the name implies, will often be super big. They'll often start somewhere in the lower atmosphere and extend really high up, sometimes reaching the ionosphere, and in this case reaching the altitude of about 90 kilometers. This is the event that was observed in 2018 in Oklahoma. And it's actually today referred to as the Oklahoma event. And these jets have been studied for the past two decades, but there is unfortunately no direct way for us to measure them or to somehow try to detect just these particular phenomena. As of today, most of the detections were either accidental or were based on the observations of an entirely different electrical phenomena. For example, in this case, this was a photograph by a citizen scientist by the name of Chris Holmes, who took these photographs on May 14th of 2018. But it's not the first time these jets have been captured, and even captured in Oklahoma, and you can find more of them in the link in the description directly from NASA. This right here is what's known as the astronomy picture of the day. And this is from back in 2007. Although technically this is a video, and in this case it kind of shows us the formation and the propagation of this jet. All of this happens super super fast. As a matter of fact, it's barely even visible. And this is at like half and one fourth of the speed. So these particular events happen really quickly, but they're also extremely, extremely powerful. And here in Oklahoma, it seems to happen quite a lot. Even during this night, it happened twice. But I guess what's unique about this phenomena compared to some of the other electrical phenomena is that they generally do not really depend on the lightning that you see right here. So even though some of the phenomena, such as elves, might form during a typical thunderstorm, these gigantic jets do not. They seem to be independent of any lightning on the surface. And all this comes from this study you can find in the description that for the first time ever was able to very thoroughly investigate, analyze and explain some of these events, including sort of helping us understand how they form, how they work and how they differ from a typical lightning. And so first of all, the analysis here determined that this was the most powerful event ever studied. This 2018 event carried approximately 100 times as much electrical charge as a typical thunderstorm lightning strike. So basically this was a like hundred of these at the same time. In more scientific terms, it carried roughly around 300 coulomb of electrical charge from the lower atmosphere of the planet all the way into the ionosphere at the rough altitude of about 90 kilometers or 50 miles. Whereas the most powerful lightning strike will usually carry about 5 coulomb and it's going to be between the cloud and the ground. With the analysis also determining that there are actually two different parts here. There's a relatively cold part and a relatively hot part. The cold part is about 200 degrees Celsius and is made out of streamers of plasma. 200 degrees Celsius is still pretty hot, but not as hot as some of the other stuff. But it also contains what scientists refer to as liters, which contain plasma that's about 4400 degrees Celsius, or basically 20 times as hot, with the hotter part being closer to the surface and the colder part being closer to space. And in this case, the scientists were even able to create a kind of a three-dimensional representation of all of this, including the analysis using relatively high-quality data that came from the accidental observations that were detected from various radio and radar systems located in the region. For example, using some of the radar data, they were able to establish that an extremely hot part of the leader portion was located above the clouds. That's where the temperatures reached about 4000 degrees. And then using radio observations in very high frequencies, they were able to observe the emissions from the streamers that were much cooler, 
and seemed to form along various tips of the developing lightning. In other words, they were forming along these lines right here and also right here. And although these tips represented some of the weaker parts of this lightning, the strongest electric current was actually right behind it inside of these readers that I previously mentioned. And one of the reasons the scientists were able to produce all this super accurate data is because they got really lucky. One of the instruments that was located nearby is NASA's Lightning Mapping Array, a lightning instrument that's able to produce very accurate observations of typical lightning strikes. And at the same time, it was also located near NOAA's Next Generation Weather Radar, an extremely powerful weather instrument that's able to detect all of this with quite a lot of detail. In other words, unlike previous relatively simple observations, here the scientists got super lucky. Especially because gigantic jets are believed to be some of the rarest electrical phenomena on the planet. Only about a thousand to maybe fifty thousand of these happen per year, compared to millions and millions of typical lightning strikes, so these are not very common. And generally they also happen around tropical storms. And this was not one of them. Yet surprisingly, this was the most powerful detected so far at least twice as powerful as anything we've seen before. And in this case, the scientists believe that all of this starts somewhere on the top of the clouds. Specifically, these cold streamers will usually start their propagation, but instead of heading downwards, they head upwards toward the ionosphere. And they then make the connection between the lower clouds and the lower parts of the ionosphere approximately 50 miles in the altitude or about 90 kilometers. Discharging all of their energy all at once but in this case, instead of going into the ground, all of this goes into the ionosphere. The electrically charged layer located above our planet that starts at approximately 50 kilometers and goes all the way up to about 900 kilometers. With the strange phenomenon then transferring all of its negative charge all at once in less than one second. Much quicker than a typical lightning. Although in this case, the radio emissions were mostly detected at an altitude of 22 to 45 kilometers whereas the optical emissions, or visual light, was only visible slightly lower, 15 to 20 kilometers. Once again suggesting that this particular phenomenon seems to be made out of two separate parts, with the bluish color in this case very likely being formed by the ionization of nitrogen that's quite prominent in these layers. The question is, why does this happen? Why upside down lightning? And the answer might actually be pretty obvious something prevents the charge from going downwards. In other words, the only reason these gigantic jets seem to occur is because something seems to block the charge from following its normal route downwards from creating typical lightning. And so when it sort of accumulates to extreme amounts, in this case anywhere from 20 to 100 times the normal amount of charge, instead of creating your typical lightning, it forms this. The upwards lightning, I guess. And the radar slash radio observations confirmed this. Prior to the detection of this gigantic jet, extremely low activity of lightning, normal lightning, was reported in this particular area. So something was suppressing it for some reason. The actual reason is unknown, but it clearly results in a buildup of huge amounts of charge that then only has one way to go. Upwards instead of downwards. But obviously this doesn't provide all of the answers just yet. Which is why this is still technically part of the so-called mysterious TLEs or transient luminous events, also known as upper atmospheric lightning, events that we've only learned about in 1989 and the events that the scientists are still trying to understand. There seem to be quite a lot of them and many of them seem to be produced for completely different reasons. But this one here seems to be of particular interest to NASA because it's believed it can actually affect not just aircraft, but also potentially different satellites. And today it's even believed that most of the electrical issues experienced by airplanes above a typical thunderstorm have actually been caused by one of these phenomena. And so this is definitely of a lot of interest to both NASA and also organizations responsible for the safety of airplanes. Although as some of the NASA's recent images from Jupiter showed us, this phenomenon definitely exists outside of planet Earth as well. It seems to be very common on Jupiter and seems to produce even more powerful jets. Electric jets that are hundreds and even thousands of times more powerful than the ones on planet Earth. Once in a while I find a paper that has a really intriguing title. Water as a metal detected at Bessie 2. 
And this is generally when I get really excited and try to discover if this is actually something worth talking about. Hello, wonderful person. Today, we're going to be discussing this right here. The study with a video right here that was literally able to turn water into a metal. But that is something I need to kind of explain in a little bit more detail. What's a metal? Now, obviously, from objects around us, we sort of understand what metal is. But the word metal has many different definitions depending on the field you're talking about. And so, for example, in regular life, a metal usually represents some sort of a substance that, when prepared, polished, or in some way fractured, will usually have lustrous appearance and will usually conduct electricity and heat really well, while also generally being very malleable, meaning that if you were to hammer it, you can actually turn it into any shape, with gold in this case being the most malleable metal of all. But it's also ductile, meaning that you can actually stretch it into some sort of a wire. Now, that's metal in daily life, but this doesn't actually tell us anything about the metal that was discovered in this paper. More importantly, it doesn't actually tell us about the idea of metals in other sciences. For example, when you hear about a metallic compound in physics or chemistry, that's not at all what they're talking about. As a matter of fact, 95 out of 118 elements in the periodic table are considered to be metals in terms of chemistry and physics. And so in this case, the definition itself is slightly different. Furthermore, it's different from the definition from astrophysics. In astrophysics, anything that's not hydrogen and helium is a metal. And that's something we've talked about on this channel many times. But this is not a definition we're using today. We're using the definition from physics. And the definition here is based on the structure of the atom of the element. In certain elements, if the outer shell of these elements is ready to lose its electrons, especially if the substance is solid or liquid, we refer to this as a metal. And because of this ability to lose electrons, that's why metals conduct electricity. So, in some sense, you can think of a metal as a highly conductive substance that conducts electricity pretty easily. And more specifically in physics, any substance that conducts electricity at absolute zero, or essentially minus 273 degrees Celsius, is considered to be a metal. But the definition doesn't end there. For example, we know that in room conditions, sodium is a metal. But if you start increasing pressure at some point, it stops being a metal. So even though in room temperature certain elements are metals and certain are not, there's actually a way to modify their metallicity by changing either the pressure or the temperature or even both. And this is exactly why in certain planets, such as Jupiter, we actually start getting metallic components inside the planet. If you were to pressurize hydrogen, if you were to pressurize helium or methane, it will actually start conducting electricity and become metallic. And because of this, these planets get extremely powerful magnetospheres. Whereas on our planet, because the pressure and the temperature is not high enough, all of this is done by the very, very large iron core on the inside, which is still metallic at these temperatures and pressures. And so metal as a definition is sort of really broad. It does include a lot of different compounds we have on the planet. It also includes a lot of elements that we normally think of as non-metals, but more importantly, Depending on the temperature and the pressure, something can become a metal or a metal can become a non-metal. And it all comes down to the ability to conduct electricity. Okay, but today we are talking about water as a metal. Now, first of all, a quick side note. Apparently this video and actually the study itself was by Philip Mason, who's also a relatively famous YouTuber who also made a video about this and his channel is known as Thunderfoot. Totally not related to this video or the topic, but just something that I wanted to mention. Anyway, water as a metal. Now, first of all, water is obviously not an element. Water, just like carbon dioxide, is a chemical compound, or essentially a substance that contains several elements on the inside. But by itself, it's still not really a metal. It does not conduct electricity. And this is, of course, something you might remember from your chemistry class. Pure water does not conduct electricity. Okay, but why is it that you can actually get electrocuted if stepping on a wet puddle that's connected to a life cable? Well, actually, in this case, the electricity is not conducted by water. Water is a really good solvent. It dissolves a lot of things. And so when it ends up dissolving salt, salt creates a lot of different charged ions, which then, in a sense, act like metals. They actually conduct the electricity with the water itself doing basically nothing. So in this case, the water is not the conductor, it's the salt inside. And so when only a small amount of ions is present in the water, and suddenly a part of a human body is introduced into the water containing these ions, because human body is a better conductor, 
All of this electricity then starts flowing through your body and, well, basically electrocutes the person. However, if you were to increase the amount of salt in the water, such as for example in the ocean water, it then becomes almost impossible to get electrocuted by this. The ions on the inside will conduct the electricity so well that any electricity passing through the water will actually never really reach your body. Your body in this case sort of starts acting almost like an insulator. Anyway, totally off topic, not really what we're talking about, but just a fun fact. So when it comes to pure water, it's not a metal, it does not conduct electricity by itself. Unless you pressurize the water. If you were to create ridiculously high pressures, such as the ones found inside Jupiter, then you end up squeezing the molecules so much that the atoms do start to act as conductors. It then does become metallic. This is something we believe happens inside many different planets that are massive enough. And for water, this pressure has to be approximately 48 million bar. That's a lot of pressure. But turns out there's also a way to create metallic water without really high pressures and without high temperatures. And this is pretty much exactly what this image right here shows. Metallic water. Water that became conductive after something was done to it. Something that was recently achieved at Bessie 2, a chemistry research facility located in Germany. And in this case, it was an experiment involving an alkali metal. Here they used an alloy of sodium and potassium. But you might have seen experiments with sodium and potassium before. You might already know what happens to these metals when you place them in water. They tend to have a really dramatic reaction, including actual fire and usually some sort of an explosion. And because of this, any experiment involving sodium, potassium or other alkali metals has always been somewhat on the dangerous side. Which is also one of the main reasons why nobody has ever discovered what exactly happens to water when you actually add alkali metals to them at that specific moment. But in this case, as you see in this video, the experimenter is going to be adding potassium to the water, making it explode as a result. But the scientists in Germany decided to do it differently. They took the potassium uh, sodium alloy and added a lot of water vapor that started to form really really thin film around the surface of the droplet. And as you can see in this beautiful video, the droplet starts to change colors and actually becomes golden. This unusual golden film on the droplet, that's metallic water. Which is really amazing, because it looks like when you turn water into a metal, it becomes golden in color. And that's something nobody expected. But what exactly happens here to make water metallic? Well, right now the scientists think that it's because of the electrons escaping from the sodium-potassium alloy, which end up dissolving in the water and thus turning the water metallic, forcing the electrons in water molecules to start conducting electricity. And this phase transition from insulating water to metallic water for some reason also turns water golden in color. Now that's something that we can't really explain right now, but it's something that I'm sure someone will try to explain in some of the future studies. And it stays this way for at least a few seconds. Now obviously we don't really know what happens after, but I'm sure once again it will be investigated in future studies. With the other discovery of course being the fact that we can actually avoid the explosions between alkali metals and water. And we can avoid this by doing what they did. By adding the water vapor instead of the actual water to the alkali metals, thus producing the chemical reaction. And so overall, definitely a really cool experiment, definitely a really cool discovery, but is it going to have any practical use? Well, that's not a question I can answer right now. This is a completely brand new discovery. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the recent and extremely exciting research around the material that you see right here known as graphene. The material that in a sense could completely redefine our society and our civilization. And also something that many different scientists around the world studied for the past 16 years trying to discover a lot of really interesting properties of this strange material. But now we've discovered something else absolutely mind-blowing. So let's talk a little bit more about this and also some of the other major discoveries around graphene. Although there's no way I'm going to be able to cover everything because there's just way too much to talk about and way too many different things that this material is able to do. I would even go so far as to say that back in the days when the ancient alchemists were looking for this magical material that's able to do a lot of things and the material that is able to essentially dissolve everything or even provide things like immortality, well, in some sense, graphene actually is that one material that provides a lot of different solutions to various problems we have today. But let's actually talk about some of the major discoveries first. 
But also, what exactly is graphene? Well, it's basically something made out of graphite, you know, that stuff that you find inside the lead of your pencil. Normally, inside graphite, you'll find layers of carbon structured three-dimensionally, but if you were to somehow remove one of these layers, it will turn into something known as graphene, which also surprisingly starts to possess a lot of different functions that graphite did not have. One of these major functions is electroconductivity. Unlike graphite, graphene becomes electroconductive. So for the past 15 years, the scientists were trying to figure out if we can actually use this as a somewhat effective semiconductor for future electronics. Here's what the structure of this material looks like if you were to look at it in the electron microscope, and you can sort of see this unusual honeycomb formation that it creates, something that graphite itself does not possess unless you remove one of the layers. Now we've actually known about graphite theoretically for many many years, but it was originally rediscovered and in some sense isolated by these two wonderful researchers you see right here, who back then were working in the University of Manchester and they won the Nobel Prize for their discovery, but it was actually made using these tools right here. They used a piece of graphite and then they used a typical scotch tape to try to extract thin layers of graphite, turning them into graphene. Discovering in the process that this was also apparently one of the strongest if not the strongest materials on the planet. But we've also known for a very long time that it possesses strange electromagnetic properties and because of its structure a lot of the electromagnetic properties can be actually modified by changing the structure. And so for example in one of the recent studies that was released only a few months ago the scientists were able to create these shapes that you see on the screen by essentially folding the graphene sheet into a slightly more deformed sheet. This was done by introducing atoms of boron in it to create these unusual structures. And what this ended up changing inside the graphene sheet is, well, it essentially turned it into a magnet. By changing the three-dimensional structure of graphene, the scientists were able to turn graphene into magnetic graphene, which by itself will already provide so many different applications for this unusual material. But that's actually not even the most exciting discovery from the past few months. The most exciting discovery is in regards to something that many different physicists, including the famous Richard Feynman, always believed to be kind of impossible. Essentially finding a way to generate energy from what's known as Brownian motion, from the motion of the particles themselves. If you remember from the chemistry class, Brownian motion is defined as this random activity of different atoms and different molecules, which essentially results in a completely impossible to predict um, motion of particles, something that for example increases as you increase temperature and decreases as the temperature drops closer and closer to the absolute zero. And naturally by itself there is really no way for us to somehow generate work or energy out of this motion, because it's unpredictable, because it's in every single direction, it's just kind of impossible to turn this into something useful. Which is of course something that most physicists believed for a very long time but it looks like that particular belief might be broken now. Once again, due to a discovery that was made only a few weeks ago that you can also read more about in the paper in the description below. And this time, the scientists from University of Arkansas developed a very interesting circuit able to capture the Brownian motion of graphene and essentially turn it into electrical power. Not a lot of power, but power nonetheless. And as you can see in this animation from the Delft University of Technology, graphene is able to exhibit a lot of different types of motion. And some of this motion, even though technically it is Brownian motion, doesn't actually act like a typical gas or fluid. It's a lot more defined and a lot more predictable. And because it's only one single sheet, we can hypothetically create a very unique circuit that essentially captures the motion of graphene as it sort of wobbles back and forth and then generates energy based on this motion, which is essentially the simplification you're looking at right here. This circuit was able to generate power and create tiny amounts of current that hypothetically, if you were to scale it to large proportions, could actually provide relatively large amounts of energy by essentially using nothing but the Brownian motion itself. In other words, the only thing that's happening here is the natural oscillations of atoms. That's where the work is coming from. But because they're more orderly and because they sort of generate predictable motions, and also because graphene is electroconductive and is able to send electrons back and forth, the scientists in this study were able to definitively show that tiny tiny amounts of current and voltage were produced when the graphene was just vibrating and essentially nothing else was affecting it. 
Now, because the amounts of current we're talking about were like in nano ampere and also nano voltages, we're still not there yet where we can use this to, for example, power your house or, for example, provide free energy for your electric vehicle. But because tiny amounts of current can then become larger amounts of current if you use more graphene, one day we could actually use this to produce tremendous amounts of energy completely for free by using nothing but carbon itself. Which is kind of ironic because right now the biggest issue with a lot of electrical production is the excess of carbon that's produced and released into the atmosphere. So it's very possible that this is actually the solution we've been looking for. Finding a way to turn carbon back into graphene and then start creating energy that way. Now this is still really really sort of far in the future and also we don't even know if this is going to be an effective way to generate energy. But right now the scientists are proposing that their current discovery could hypothetically be used in some of these smaller devices, like for example powering something that requires a relatively small amount of current, such as maybe pacemakers or a lot of other tools where batteries cannot be replaced quite easily, but require a long-term functionality and relatively small amounts of current. And according to them, you could technically place approximately a million of these circuits in a tiny millimeter by millimeter square, and this would hypothetically provide just enough electricity to power some of the low power devices. But though the theory itself is definitely there and it does seem to make a lot of sense, the problem right now would be making that million circuits. Because when it comes to manufacturing massive amounts of graphene and especially creating these tiny circuits, we're still really really far from being able to do so effectively. As a matter of fact, using a tape right here might be the most effective way we have right now. And all of the graphene that was uh, created last year, for example, was only mostly used for research purposes. Only about $9 million worth of graphene was produced, and that's actually very, very little, considering that we would need so much more, thousands and actually millions times more, just to create a tiny little battery. So in that sense, this is still a very expensive and somewhat time-consuming process. Even though the theory is there and we can hypothetically produce infinite energy by just using Brownian motion of graphene, we just don't really know how to make it effectively just yet. And that's of course the next step and potentially the next Nobel Prize to be won by someone else who finds a very effective way of producing massive amounts of graphene that we can then use to create so many different tools. With hopefully the first such tool being an extremely effective space elevator where the elevator cable would be made from massive amounts of um, graphene. So far graphene seems to be the best candidate for creating such a device. Nevertheless, this is a super exciting discovery and will hopefully in the next few decades help humanity to overcome both the carbon excess problems and the energy problems we're going to be having in the next few decades. But I guess until we learn more about graphene or until we discover something else exciting about this unusual material, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. Check out the paper in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.